Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for sticking through. This is the third day of our meeting, second day of the MAG meeting. Uh, as you know, we had the open consultations yesterday, the first day of the MAG meeting on Tuesday. So this is the second day of the MAG meeting. Um, we did send out a revised agenda yesterday, and I hope all of you received it. Um, and it's also being displayed on the screen. Okay, and with that, and we are still using the speaking queue, so uh, please log on, and um, if you want to make an intervention, please use the speaking queue. Okay, with that, I hand it over to Lynn to start the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Changatai. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming back and coming back so promptly as well. Um, we do have quite a bit to get through today. Um, the first thing I want to do is put the agenda up and have everybody look through it and talk through what we actually think we're going to get through today before I call for approval of it, because as, as Chengatai said, it was posted only last night. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, after a few opening remarks, we would actually move to a session which actually looks at a strategic discussion on what we want to get from the IGF um, 2019 program. Um, so I think we should start by reviewing um, some of the assumptions, such as a cohesive program, three tracks, et cetera. Um, and I'm just taking those as a given because some of them have been in, in place for a few years and clearly there was a robust MAG process at the early part of the year that, that um, supported that. And then um, we would ask, so this is a heads up for those of you that were fairly deeply engaged in the narrative descriptions. Um, I think it would be helpful if we actually pulled the narrative descriptions up, ask people from those ad hoc working groups to talk to them, because they were fairly, um, I guess, descriptive or definitive in terms of what they were hoping to get out of these tracks. And I think we need to make sure that we're, we understand that, we're on board with that, and that our process as we work through the workshop evaluation process is going to support that and deliver to that. And that may mean we need to add some additional steps or, or think about that a bit differently. So we'll um, start there. And then I think if we get some clarity on what we want to do with those three tracks, with those narratives, I think the discussions around the main sessions and where they're placed and what we might do with high level, um, et cetera, will um, will will fall out more more naturally. Um, so that would be the session we would come to immediately after lunch. And I think we have a good amount of time slotted for that, an hour and a half or so. Um, uh, Daniela is going to um, kind of share some thoughts, having listened to the discussion um, over the last couple of days on the meeting um, title and themes, see if we can close on that today. And then um, in the last sort of 45 minutes to an hour, we were just asking the Secretariat to give us a kind of a brief on the state of the preparations. Um, that may take even less time than that. I think you're probably all aware that we extended the deadline from tomorrow until Sunday, 2359 UTC to be exact. There's always confusion over what time zone we meant to close it and was somebody in before or after or um, so the Secretariat started to be quite, quite concrete with that. Um, so that's kind of the work we'd like to get through today. Are there any um, suggestions, AO business, any a AOB, any other points of clarity before I call for approval of the agenda? Not seeing any. Um, I will call for approval of the agenda then. Again, wait a few moments for people, people participating online to get in the queue here. Okay, not seeing any objections, we'll call the agenda approved. And the first item are just some brief opening statements from myself, um, host country co-chair, and, and Dennis from DESA. Um, the first thing I actually want to do is to thank um, Jovan yesterday for um, his, his time with us and his presentation on the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, since day one, they've been very, very generous, I think, with respect to um, addressing the IGF. In fact, first thing in the morning, the day after the, the uh, uh, panel was launched, Ambassador Gill was with us for a full hour. Um, we've had their engagement at, I think, every successive MAG meeting since then. 
Um, so I really appreciate um, them, and I think that's a good signal, the recognition of kind of the importance of the IGF, but also um, what they can learn and, and take away. So I really want to thank and, and formally kind of recognize both Ambassador Gill, um, Jovan, and their team. I think they've been very, very generous with their time and, and supportive here, so appreciate it. Um, so coming now to um, – Actually, I'll, I'll wait and do this because I gave you all the heads up already in terms of what I'm looking for from the narrative ad hoc, ad hoc working groups. Um, so first let me turn to Daniela and see if there's any kind of reflections, comments. Um, input. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, I would just like to thank you all for the input you gave yesterday. Uh, and especially also, of course, um, it was very helpful to have Jovan here uh, to tell us more about the high-level panel. I think we will all have to reflect a little bit on that when the report comes out. So I think that should be point of our agenda next time, then in June in Berlin. Um, uh, going through my notes, or when I, when I did that last night, uh, um, I had the impression that um, there was a lot of support for more focus uh, in the program and a lot of support for the three themes. So thanks again also for those who worked on the narratives. I think they are really very well done. And, uh, and I um, yeah, subscribe totally what Lynn just said. We should, uh, I think, stick to that. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. We should also recognize, I think, the German government's effort to work with us in terms of some of the kind of desired areas of improvement um, while being flexible and creative at the same time. <laughs> and um, very much taking to heart the desire to actually reach out to other communities, such as um, various senior policymakers, um, as well as the private sector as well. So just very appreciative and think we have an excellent, excellent partner. Dennis, is there anything you'd like to say? Good morning, everyone. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is one thing that I can update the group uh, f about the MAG renewal. Uh, we have uh, gotten some kind of indication from our, from Under Secretary General uh, to start the MAG renewal latest first of May. Uh, publish the call for uh, MAG renewal uh, first of May and keep the call open uh, for uh, eight weeks until the end of uh, June. So that's an update from my side. Thank you, Dennis. I very, very much appreciate doing that. Um, anytime I speak to someone in, in uh, DESA or the EOSG's office, when they say, what can we do to help? I said, the first thing you can do is timely appointment of the MAG in the MAG chair. Um, that's how this work gets done. It really is, is critically important. It's hard to emphasize how important that is. So really appreciate that. That, um, that seems to have been fully, fully taken on board. So um, over the last few days, um, we've covered uh, quite a number of areas, um, some you know, quite concrete, some more open and brainstorming, which was the whole purpose of this session, was to see if we could get some um, fresh ideas, um, any sort of reframing or that sort of thing. So I think all those discussions will serve our discussion um, here today um, very, very well. What we've previously said and agreed, and of course it was based on very clear and strong signals, some for several years, on um, areas needing improvement was that we were going to work on building a more cohesive, focused program. Um, last year, the MAG actually agreed to reduce the number of parallel sessions. In fact, we didn't do that because we had a, a reduced um, IGF. In fact, we had three days, not four days, and we didn't have a day zero. So um, we thought that that was too big a drop in terms of you know, workshops and sessions in, in total. Um, this year, I assume we're still committed to the same thing because it's still um, an, a, a strong um, request. So that would mean that we're working on building a more cohesive fo focused program, um, reducing the number of parallel sessions. And in line with both of those, we moved to three tracks. And we developed narratives. And those narratives were intended to help the community and us focus on making concrete advancement in a small number of kind of very important, very consequential topics and improving the outputs from these tracks. And I think if we're, um, when we stay with that strong um, focus, I think that actually provides a really good vehicle for outreach to other um, activities as well because we have a short, concise story we can tell people and we should be able to start reaching out to um, other groups. We had a meeting the other morning um, with the vice chair from BEREC, the European 
regulators who's very interested in working with the IGF and looking to see if there's something we might um, structure or do or, or pull them in. Um, so, you know, I would encourage all of us as we're going through the narratives here in a few moments to think about what are the other groups or the other players or the other actors we can reach out to. And again, there I recall the Secretary General's words that we need to increase the outreach, both in terms of um, kind of disciplines, multidisciplinary. And again, his examples were, I think, anthropologists, social scientists, and philosophers. Um, and also, the UN and his continuing focus, and it's been our focus since day one in terms of reaching out um, to the, those people that aren't connected. Um, so um, developing countries, the South, marginalized communities, et cetera. That's always been a, a very central focus of everything we've done, and I think we just need to keep that, that front and center as well. So um, what I would, would suggest, and looking for um, you know, comments from the, from the MAG, is that we start with um, individual reviews of each of the three narratives so that we ask for volunteers from, um, presumably from those ad hoc working groups to speak through that narrative open it up for questions to the MAG in terms of what was the group thinking, what were they expecting in terms of the output from that. Um, we need to all be on board with that. We all need to understand it because that has to be central and top of our minds when we actually go through our um, workshop reviews. And I think that's all I would say there. So again, the next step is individual reviews of each one of the narratives by the three tracks. Um, and the goal is to ensure that we all understand um, what the ad hoc working group was looking for, that we all um, support that, that we're all clear on um, what that means we need to keep in mind when we go through the reviews. And then I think as kind of a secondary discussion, does that mean we need to add a step to our workshop review process or, um, uh, you know, a, a secondary review when we look at what has come through each one of those tracks or, or what? I mean, and I'm really looking to a couple of the the individuals that are still here with respect to the working group on workshop evaluation and prep because um, there might be a piece of additional um, brainstorming work that we actually need from from that group. So it's open for the floor now. Are there any suggestions, comments, alternative views of how we should approach the next the next section session? I'm just trying to give everybody a moment to think about it, and then in a minute I'll ask if we're ready to proceed along those lines. So I see some heads nodding yes in the room, with apologies to those that are participating online, because I obviously can't see heads nodding, but I don't see anything in the in the chat room that would indicate different view. So then with that, I guess the next step is to um, ask who's going to be the first volunteer to walk through um, one of the narratives. And I would, people know where to find the narratives. You can go to the workshop submission process and eat, there are direct links to each one of them there. And uh, that would be great. Lewis is actually going to put them up um, here on the screen. Is there a volunteer to go first, or do we just start with whoever's listed first on the website? Oh, sorry, Paul, you, you actually had your hand up first. And if I remember correctly, you actually triggered this last time, too, so it, it's, it seems right. Thank you, Paul. I think, I think Ben Pitt moved to the post there. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody's read, read through it anyway, and I, I'm guessing everyone has a fundamental understanding of what was captured uh, in, in, in under digital inclusion. But I, I, think, I think what's important is that uh, when you read through digital inclusion, you realize how it touches on so many of the uh, SDGs. Uh, I think it's, it's very cross-cutting, and it, it really addresses a lot of the internet uh, governance challenges. Um, I, I, I don't think we really want to read through it here. Um, do we? Yes. 
<laughs> okay. If anything, it will give time for people to really sort of absorb it and, and think and think through it. Okay, then what 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 we captured is an echo. Okay. So di digital inclusion is a term that encompasses a broad sector of key internet governance issues. IGF 2019 Digital Inclusion Track aims to provide a framework for assessing and considering the various elements and policies which can improve access to equitable opportunities in the digital age. Digital inclusion is about both identifying those with less or no access to the internet e.g. the underserved communities, marginalized communities, the minorities, people with disabilities, or people lacking digital literacy. And it is about activities related to the achievement of an inclusive information society. Inclusion also means bringing everybody to the discussion table and ensuring everyone's voice is heard and treated equally in the decision-making process. Digital inclusion is about having the right access skills, motivation, and trust and confidence to go online. Furthermore, fostering digital inclusion contributes to a stronger economy and enhanced economic development through the shared wealth, shared employment, and equal opportunity for all. So that, that yeah, that's our uh, synopsis. synopsis. <laughs> but as, as I mentioned, what, 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 what I find interesting is when, when you start looking at uh, tagging it to the issues, and the issues that uh, we, we picked up is access, accessibility, affordability, infrastructure, internet security, digital literacy, digital divide, outreach, poverty eradication, economic development, emerging technologies, social inclusion, multilingual, meaningful connectivity, design for inclusion, and community networks. And we, we aligned it with uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 16. And the, what, what it shows us is uh, with, without digital inclusion, you know, we're not going to achieve the Sustainable de Development Goals. Uh, we're not going to create an a equal society, equal global society. Um, so yeah, the, the, I'll put it to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So what, what I think we need to really get clear on here, and the description, for instance, says aims to provide a framework. Um, I think the, the meta-level question is, given we're hosting um, this event with people from across the world, online and offline, um, and we all believe inclusion is, inclusion is critically important, it's one of the key themes we put what do we want to walk away from those four days with? You know, in the past, I think it's been sort of a collection of discussions on all these topics. There is absolutely intent in every one of those discussions. Um, sometimes it's about sharing information and, and exchanges, and sometimes it's about advancing a program or sharing. There is intent in every one of them. But the one thing we keep hearing is that people are looking for more from this community. So if we're serious about that, having spent four days talking about inclusion, what are, what are the outputs? What are we actually looking to impact or to affect? Are, were we serious about providing a framework for some of these things? Or, again, I'm trying to be a little provocative here. Not much, actually, I think, in terms of some very clear signals we're getting about what's, what's expected. So Halani. Halani, you have the floor, and Halani's online. Chair, can you hear me? Very faint. Let's just give them one more minute here to work on it, Halani. We can't hear you very well here in the room. The scribes can hear you, which is excellent, so we can revert to reading the 
the transcription. So, Halani, if you keep speaking, the scribes can hear you and they will transcribe it. If you've already written something and it's in the chat room, perhaps they can just post it. I was going to say, Chair, that uh, we do need at least to walk away, obviously, with some of the questions that are here, but also really understand what inclusion means. Uh, it, I don't think everyone is talking about the same thing when we talk about inclusion. Is it simply getting people to open up a computer? Is it simply getting people to use Facebook? Are we talking about more economically, socially, in, uh, emotionally meaningful connectivity that improves lives and makes people happier? And I think that's a moving target over time. And we do need to recognize the changing nature of what inclusion means. Is it a human rights respecting, freedom of expression enabling type of inclusion? Uh, or what is it? Is it just counting people who have ever used the internet? And I think that's really also something policymakers, I think, would like to understand, certainly in the countries we work in. Thank you. Thank you, Helani. I think that's a very good point, and I think that echoes Paul's point as well when he was pointing out the uh, great variety and the, the tags of the issues that were also. And I know this is hard, and it is absolutely going to be a struggle, but if we, I think we need to lean into it, as I used to say at Digital Equipment, and really figure out um, if we can identify a small number of areas that we think we can have a significant impact on through that annual meeting. It's not the only thing the IGF ecosystem does all year. We have NRIs and DCs and best practice forums and a host of other meetings that we all engage in. So the annual meeting is not kind of the sum total of an IGF output, but it is a significant marker in what we all do and that we all come together as a community once a year in that meeting to try and concretely advance issues. And we can't advance every issue, and we've already admitted that, and we've already said we need to be more cohesive and more focused. Um, when the MAG goes away to evaluate their workshops, are they evaluating each one of them individually on the quality of each workshop, or are we actually trying to work towards some threaded discussion or threaded set of discussions with an objective or an aim at the end? Daniela? Thank you. I think what is really helpful are the illustrative policy questions that are coming after the narrative. Uh, I think they are really very well designed and focused and they cover a lot of sorts of inclusion but in a very concrete manner. For example, affordability issues. What factors should be considered? Or the second one, education. What do we want to have as educational measures? Or, for example, the very concrete questions on what tools could be developed to promote better Internet access. So I think maybe we should also have in mind those questions when evaluating the workshops. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. Um, let, I'll go to Maria in a moment. Um, I think some of the questions were illustrative and not necessarily directional. Um, and, I mean, it's a very good point, actually, that you just reminded us that, of course, until we actually see the workshop submissions and the policy questions they're submitting, um, that's obviously a very, very key piece of, of what our community thinks is important and what they think are the, you know, the most consequential and most topical issues as well. Um, so maybe we need to think about this more in a kind of a intent. What is the MAG's intent when they actually review these? Are we trying to identify a small number of policy areas within each one of these? And then what does that mean for our, our reviews and our process? Uh, Maria, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Lynn. Apologize for missing the previous today. I was attending a conflicting meeting in Berlin. Um, I think that this point about what it means, digital inclusion, and what are the outcomes that we expect from this uh, line of work in, in the uh, coming IGF, it's very well suited for doing this interconnection with the work of the uh, high-level panel in digital cooperation that we heard yesterday from the report in the sense that what was mentioned there is that today digital inclusion means a lot of how like traditional areas or traditional services go to the digital and that means uh, either like to have a more inclusive reach uh, of people that before was not able to connect to these kind of services or or, or uh, different uh, uh, access to health, access to uh, social security, whatever it is, um, but at the same time to uh, confront the risk of people uh, leaving, being left behind because their inability to have the digital skills that are required to interact with these new technologies that are inserted on top of this type of services. So I think that in this uh, track we should look uh, very deeply to how technology is impacting the exercise of uh, social, economic and cultural rights. And in that sense, uh, like see how this input can uh, interconnect with the work that the high level panel was mentioning yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That, that actually was very, very good and very helpful comment. And maybe one of the additional processing steps we need is once we have the workshops in and the team of reviewers, and again, it's going to be the same team, diverse team, that's going to be reviewing all of the submissions under um, that particular track. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity for a, a conference call afterwards to try and sort of assess whether or not coming out of those submissions and the policy questions, you can move it up to one or two meta-level questions and that that might actually suggest a structure for the, the, um, the few days. You know, we're under inclusion, as an example. Um, we see these, you know, two major categories of, of questions and, and we're going to and maybe that's where we have an introductory session or, you know, the topping and tailing of these tracks where we actually have a one session which kind of does an introduction to that higher level meta question over the theme and then the workshops are structured underneath that and then we come back at the end and try and um, kind of draw conclusions or outcomes or, you know, or directions or something from them. But what that requires is our, the traditional MAG review process has been everybody reviews the workshops and they're all graded, everybody does it independently, they come back, they're all aggregated and we look at the top, you know, if we, just by way of reference, if we can take 80 workshops, you know, it's assumed that the top 60 that scored highest are in and then we kind of use the other 20 to um, address any kind of gaps or, or diversity. What I think we're starting to um, look at here is a, a different process that actually looks at the workshops that have come in, looks at the policy questions, tries to assess where the community's kind of focus and, and interest or concerns are, and that we drive a couple of meta-level sessions or policy questions around that and the workshops underneath that, possibly with some topping and tailing of them so that we actually introduce them and then um, have a, um, a process to pull them back in terms of some some conclusions. Mary, Mary, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair, for giving me the floor. For me, uh, inclusion, I'll be also looking at um, or looking for the voices of those that you want to include. Are we in uh, the workshop proposal, do we have people from the grassroots that will tell us exactly what they want? So that, that should be one of the things we'll be looking at for. We should include those that will tell us, um, well, this is what I want and this is what the type of the gap that is existing in my own community and um, anything that will bring that back bring in close the gap that that's what we, we want so uh, that's the type of inclusion i would i would want us also to be looking at thank you thank you mary 
Ananda? Ananda, you have uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, the, in February has come up with uh, what is known as uh, the I Inclusive Internet Index uh, in February this year. So it measures uh, four domains of uh, Internet inclusion or digital inclusion that we are talking about. Uh, the first is availability which measures the quality and breadth of available infrastructure required for access and levels of internet users. The second one is affordability, uh, talks about cost of access relative to income and the level of competition in the internet marketplace. Third one is relevance, which measures the existence and extent of local language content and relevant content. The fourth one is readiness, which is a measure of capacity to access the internet, including skills, cultural acceptance, and supporting policy. So I think uh, this is a global survey made uh, by the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. And uh, these policy questions that uh, Daniela was talking about should uh, revolve around these four domains, which captures more or less uh, the issues that we are dealing with uh, digital inclusion. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ananda. That obviously sounds like a good, a good resource. Putting both your comments and Mary's together, I mean, it sort of strikes me, again, we have a little more time in the extended process this year, that if we actually have um, the workshops chosen by the end of, by the middle of June, um, if we had aggregated them up to a, a, a small number of higher level policy issues, um, it gives us two options. It allows us to bring people in if we're going to do an introductory session, somebody from the economists or somebody from you know any one of the other disciplines that we keep saying we want to reach out to, with a specific, you know, a high level invite, and that we're asking them to be part of a kickoff session for this particular track or theme. Um, it also um, might allow us to actually run some online surveys or some other processes with the community between mid-June and October and November so that to Mary's point, we can actually reach out more broadly than those people that come into the with some specific inputs or some specific um, requests. Um, so I think, you know, again, I think we found it hard to get broad participation and policymakers and private sector people in when we say, here's the workshop, and you look at the workshop, and there's like 11 different tracks and different. It's hard to get a feeling for people from outside about why they should come and participate and what's in the, what's of value. But if we actually are able to say, here's a, you know, a, a meta level policy question we're going to address, we want a kickoff session that's going to open it up. We've got some other workshops underneath. Here's where they are. We can do a community survey before, we can tail it at the end, we can get some high-level people in to come and kick it off in a way that's a lot of fresh blood, hopefully fresh thinking, some creativity, and meets the other objectives that we, you know, we have so often, so often stated. And again, this is not a lot of planning on my part. I'm trying to piece together things that I'm hearing and threads that have come together over the last couple of days. Um, what I really hope we don't do is leave here having evaluated a whole bunch of workshops on an individual basis and you know, the program looks and feels just like it did last year. Because if so, I think we haven't listened to the community who says they're looking for something different. And by the community, I don't mean the 2,000 people, 3,000 people that participate regularly, you know, all of us, these old home weeks. It's everybody else that we're supposed to be doing this for. So if we're really serious about reaching out and engaging and, and helping the world deal with a lot of the other problems, we need to find a way to kick up our game, pick up our game here. And I am open to any and all suggestions and would love to hear lots of other voices. So with that, I'll go to Susan Chalmers, who's in the queue. Susan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, I'm just, uh, I'd just like to ask a clarifying question. Um, so it seems that what is being proposed is um, that we receive all of the workshops, they're evaluated per theme, um, and then we develop each theme, for each theme, 
a few policy questions, uh, meta-level questions, and then from that we develop an outcome um, that drives, uh, that responds or um, reacts to these meta-level policy questions. Um, if that is the proposal, I agree that would be um, a more structured approach and it would build upon the work that we've already undertaken to drive a more focused uh, program. Uh, so I guess, I guess my question is, is that what we are discussing right now? And if so, then the only thing from a, a process point of view that I would mention um, is that it kind of presumes that all of their, each MEG member, um, sorry, for each theme, you'll have the same group of MEG members reviewing a theme. So if you split the MEG into three different parts, you'd have one part reviewing digital inclusion, one part reviewing security, one part reviewing um, data governance. Um, that presumes that we'll all receive uh, an equal number of proposals per theme. It could be that um, you receive um, 80 proposals on digital inclusion and 20 proposals on security. Um, so I think to have a holistic view of any one theme and to develop these meta questions as proposed would require the same group of MEG members to review the same theme. So I guess I just wanted to ask um, for clarity on 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 um, what we're trying to achieve, I guess, um, and then if once we have that, then then we can discuss how that uh, the process might fulfill that. Thank you. Thank you. And let me answer your one or two specific questions, and then I'll go to Halani. Um, I do think that outlines generally what we're trying to achieve. Um, there may be some specifics in the process we need to look at. Um, I'm not so much, I wasn't thinking about equal number of, because I don't suspect we'll get it, but they need to be manageable. Back on my, when I was a MAG member, I had to review 200 odd proposals. That's when every MAG member was reviewing every proposal that came in. So if we expect we're going to have between 300 and 400 proposals, and there's got to be some distribution since every one of those tracks are of high interest to a great part of the community, I don't think it's going to be 80%, 10%, 10%. So I think what needs to be is that it needs to be manageable by track. And if maybe if one of them is really oversubscribed, um, oversubscribed, if one of them has a, a, a very, very, very large number of proposals, Perhaps we could even ask the secretariat to split them further apart by the tags within that. And maybe we have two groups under security to look at them because there's a great deal of them that are focused on tag A and another um, large number of proposals that are, on, that are on tag B. I think we can manage it so that it's manageable and still gets the same group of people reviewing the same theme or if we have to sort of <coughs> sub-theme of proposals. But yes, what I was suggesting was that um, we look through, with the same team of people, look through one set of proposals, evaluate those proposals, and we're going to have policy questions that should have been submitted with every one of the proposals. And in fact, if they don't have policy questions, they will probably get quite a low score. So we will have a good indication from the community of what policy questions are in front of them and what they're concerned about. And in my mind, it's kind of more of an aggregation and a grouping. And then I think the MAG can say, well, what does this tell us about sort of what the community is thinking? Uh, you know, I would suggest there are some other documents we can go away and read and, and keep in mind. I think the SecGen's tech strategy is one of them. In fact, you can almost any one of his speeches and certainly his entry speech when he came in um, a few years ago. Um, we all have our own communities that we know what their interests are. And I think use that as well to kind of shape a, a high-level meta question. Not moving away from the workshop proposals and the policy questions, but really trying to take all of our expertise and kind of combine them into something that's really compelling as a topic that's actually going to have a threaded discussion and, and hopefully deliver something, you know, quite concrete at the end. There were some discussions yesterday which said, um, you know, we, we pass reports on and they're kind of interesting, but it's hard to say, you know, this is something you should really consider and go away and 
and somehow that it's almost like it's interesting reading as opposed to something which is useful in a more constructive way. And I think we need to make that that little push. Just just me. Um, Halani, Halani, you have the floor, and Halani's online. Chair, for the record, Halani Gautaya. <coughs> Just um, a small thought listening to what Maria was saying about connecting with the high level panel on the access team and what you were calling for, which is how do we reach the people who don't come to the IGF and bring in those philosophers and you know everyone that was talked about yesterday. If we have these three concrete themes and if we have a nice output document per theme at the end of the IGF through whatever mechanism, uh, uh, stating you know the viewpoints, frameworks, uh, or any kind of policy recommendations that were have been synthesized uh, and summarized, could we also proactively send this as the MAG or as the Internet Governance Forum to those uh, people and communities who are not at the IGF? So obviously we do this individually through our individual roles and through our stakeholder communities. But I'm talking about something a little bit more explicit. So a formal connection with the high level panel, although that won't be around by then. Similarly, a more formal communication about here are the key issues that were discussed on the data governance panel to let's say the key 10 stakeholders, and that might be governments that are considering this, the European Union that's engaging with this. Uh, this could be key thought leaders uh, related to algorithm and data governance who don't always show up at the IGF. And policy recommendations are only as useful as how well we identify who the policies can be acted on by. So I think if we ask the workshop summary uh, writers, the rapporteurs, to specify who can act on the policies that you now try to answer during your workshop, that would be a first step. Second, if we are collectively a group of, you know, MAG members are writing the thematic summaries, we should explicitly have in mind who can act on these, who are these communities. And third, the Secretariat uh, does a job of reaching out uh, thematically. Thank you. Thank you, Helani. Those are very, very interesting comments. Thank you. And thank you for <laughs> sticking with us and participating online as well. Sylvia, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Sylvia Cadena, Technical Community. Um, well, taking some of the comments from Susan about how we, how we do this, right? Um, seems to me that um, we, we might, if we go with, with separating and tagging in, in, in all of those, um, we, we might get into a, a problem with how we do the random allocation that we have been uh, discussing before, so that there is no, um, MAG members will not self uh, decide, let's say, what sort of expertise they are supposed to have to be able to uh, uh, assess some, a pool of, of the proposals. So I guess, um, if, if I understand correctly where you are trying to lead us, um, my guess is that we will need, besides checking on the, the, um, our pool of, of proposals, we will probably need um, a separate time to go through not only the policy questions that we re checked on our bucket of proposals that might not be the whole bucket on that particular theme, and discuss with the other MAC members that assess the other groups to try to come up with those meta questions that you, that you mentioned, right? And then try to figure out what will be the mechanism to chair or, or uh, tailor those, those discussions into a one, one document, let's say. It could be an output document on that theme or whatever. But what the, the part that I am not that clear is, okay, we have, from June to November, after we have finished the selection process and all of that, to um, 
help the people that are actually going to get to Berlin to finalize, confirm speakers, support and mentor the, guy, the ones that are going to be merged with each other. There is a bunch of other things that are going to happen there. So when do you think all of that process of collation will happen if the actual sessions have not happened? And there are changes at the actual event, right? People submit proposals, and then for whatever reason, something else happens, and then someone is not there, or I don't know. And then there are minor modifications to how a workshop proposal is actually displayed or presented at the actual event. So the, 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 the support, for example, for the Diplo folks that have been doing on-site reports straight you know, from the bat of, uh, after every session has always been very useful. But to go back and look, I don't know, at the 20, 30, or 50 proposals that are presented in, in one track, and then come up with a, a policy review questions, uh, organize the meta question, and do an analysis, and, and, and gather all those contributions, I'm wondering how that, the timeline for that process will be. Uh, Jen uh, explained yesterday how the APR IGF does it with the synthesis document. Um, that might be a, a useful thing, thing to look at. Um, but I'm just wor wondering, OK, how much commitment and, and how much the mark can actually take to, to actually do that job? Because it's, in my mind, that's, that's a humongous amount of work. If we really want to have a, a, um, an outcome document that actually reflects what happened at the meeting, um, it can be done before. We might set up the process now, uh, but then when, if, if it's in December, we might lose the momentum, right? So, so I don't know. I, I'm just looking for some clarification of, of how you see the timeline going and, and how can we, uh, you know, uh, contribute. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. I see the timeline is as tight as always. Exciting because I hope we're going to be doing a lot of new things with it. And I also see the ability to call in um, support from the community as well. And I actually wasn't expecting that there would be a final full document available on the last day of the meeting. Mm -hmm. I think if we actually wrapped up each one of the themes with a, a workshop or a session that kind of debated what we thought we heard, you know, what are some of the takeaways, what we might do with it, and so that we actually support a really good kind of concluding dialogue at the end, we can make the reports afterwards and we actually have a little bit more time and we can actually thread things and pull them together. And maybe we have a report targeted from one theme which is targeted to policymakers and another one that's targeted to a, another sort of entity. So Super. some of the details I haven't really thought through yet, but it <coughs> starts with getting to a small number of topics and I think threading the discussions. Sounds, to support just another point of clarification. That sounds to me a lot like the taking stock sessions that used to happen at the IGF a few years ago. Is that more or less what you have in mind? Because then if a, there is a, a taking stock um, session planned, it's more or less a, ma a main session and then there are MAG members or volunteers from the community appointed to track what's going on on different sessions and then you kind of put it together. We can go back and look at how the taking stock sessions were organized and see what can we learn from that and how to improve it. But it seems to me that that is what you are thinking or, or not. <laughs> those were, as I said, no, not really, because those were more, to my mind, if I'm recalling the same thing, you are kind of report outs. And and Jangatai shaking his head yes. And I actually think something which is more of a discussion, which is what have we just heard? What can we take away? Who would it be helpful to? What else can we do with it? Um, you know, are there things we should consider for the work as we go forward? It's a great opportunity to, to engage DCs and NRIs and things as well in terms of all the kind of work that we do across the IGF ecosystem for kind of feeders, if you will, to the work of the next the next year. And again, I'm. I have to say I'm making some of this up as we're all talking in terms of what the process would look like. So I'm jumping in and help. Venny, you have the floor. Thank you. And I wasn't waving at you, actually. I was waving at Raquel, but she didn't pay attention. Um, and now she's wondering what's going on. Uh, the, the, I, uh, Sylvia mentioned, actually talked a little bit about what I was uh, initially planning to talk. So I'll switch a little bit uh, to uh, two points. So the first is the question to Daniel and the um, fund that we had, that the German government has, or thanks to the members of the parliament, I assume, have allocated for the travel 
um, uh, which is extremely uh, generous uh, contribution to the budget for people from underserved regions, developing countries, etc., countries in transitions. Would that money be available uh, for, uh, I mean, would, uh, sorry, I'll go, I'll go step back. When people send applications, you know, co uh, workshops, etc., they put names of uh, participants, speakers, etc. Would that money be available for some of those speakers, or was it be, would it be on first come, first serve base? Uh, I'm just asking because I got some questions like, well, we want to put this and this uh, on, on a panel, but we are not sure we can find funding for them to actually come. And I think it may be important for people from countries with different experience uh, than the one which is in the north part of the hemisphere have to come and share, especially uh, with regards to how they'll deal with, uh, let's say, providing internet access, uh, dealing with cyber security, uh, tackling hate speech, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that would, be, that would be very helpful, but also that is uh, to know exactly, you know, whether they can use, but also Shengitai is the secretariat going to be able to work with the current resources that you have, because I remember at the donors meeting the other day, you were saying that there is like a couple of empty, so to speak, you know, empty slots, interns, you are looking for interns and a couple of other folks to help you. Uh, do you have the resources to actually uh, work with this uh, bigger amount of work that you will have. And on the brighter side, so that people can cheer a little bit, uh, you were talking about the fact that we may have hundreds of applications and we just announced the extension of the deadline thanks to uh, partly my question on the first day. Maybe I should have made another proposal to move it one day earlier and we deal with the hundreds of applications which will be late. So you can announce, you know, a shorter term. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, okay, I, I got it. People are laughing. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you for, for your questions. So um, in the application process for the travel grant, uh, the applicant has to state if they have a function at the IGF, because the purpose is to bring in people that will enrich the entire experience of the IGF. So if they're panelists, if they're organizing a session, I mean, we're, we're, we're not just limiting it to that, but they have to state a case for the uh, application. So we are, we, we are considering that. Um, we are in a drive for um, interns and um, I think we will be able to manage. I mean, these guys don't need sleep for about two weeks, and then it'll be fine. So yeah, no, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll do it one way or another. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was also told last night about a UN volunteers program, where there's a couple of hundred um, volunteers that can be made available for short-term, two to three months work. Um, and the work is online. It's not that people come physically. I don't know if there's an opportunity for us to, to pull in a few people. I mean, even a handful of people would be huge. Um, and there are people from all. I mean, I think there are retirees and all sorts of, um, all sorts of people. Yeah. No, I mean, together with uh, you and Desa, we, we are looking at all these options. And we are going to have a fellow coming in as well. So um, that will help. And for the applications, uh, we are using the National and Regional Initiatives Network to help us uh, sort through those applications and um, prioritize the ones that we should look at. So I think we do have a plan that will manage. I have full confidence in this ability, this community's ability to be creative if what we can come up with is actually interesting enough and attractive enough and people are passionate enough about it. We're not talking about a huge exercise. We're talking about a relatively time-constrained um, exercise, um, pulling in people who are already deeply engaged in a lot of these topics, and um, therefore any kind of startup curve should be, should be short. Um, Carlos, you have the floor. Yes, quickly. I, it's just a justification. I'll, I'll have to leave the meeting in a few minutes because UNESCO is very interested in our uh, 
best practices for local content and they are having a meeting in a few minutes to discuss this so i'll leave the meeting for a while just to make sure that unesco doesn't leave us <laughs> thank you thank you carlos Tamea, you have the floor well that was quick <laughs> I just put my hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding this exercise we're going through correctly, so, so stop me if I'm, if I'm going off on a tangent, please. Um, um, but I am looking at what we have already on the table. So we have the three themes, we had the narratives, um, and we have people in the world right now submitting their questions and their session proposals under those three. Um, and I, and I it, there's a lot of merit to what we're, I think we're talking about now and trying to make sure that, that underneath those three buckets we don't go into too much various details, that we, that we make sense of the agenda afterwards, um, and then we can actually pull out um, a sensible reporting from there that actually would draw everything together. So <laughs> you're still with me here. Um, so there are a couple of initiatives um, in, in various policy forums they are looking at, um, so we're looking at these things vertically, that they're looking at it more from a horizontal point of view and looking at what are the policy dimensions around each of these issues or all of the digital issues. Um, so um, the OECD uh, has just launched their uh, Going Digital Framework. They have seven of these horizontal areas. ICC, um, we launched our own framework um, in about two years ago. We have four of these horizontal areas. We are looking at a piece of technology or all of technology and looking at it, how, what are the policies that affect it from an economic perspective, from a social and cultural perspective, what are the technical dimensions and what are the broader governance uh, dimensions of each. And I'm wondering if we could do this exercise under these three vertical pillars that we have, that we have some sort of a, a horizontal view uh, and make sure in our selection process that each of these three pillars that we have are considered and, and we have workshops, we have sessions that consider them from these various policy perspectives. Because generally I think we, that happens at the IGF. Somebody is feeling more strongly aligned with an economic view, somebody else is more strongly aligned with a technical view. And I'm not saying these correspond to the, to the communities, um, everybody can have other views. Um, but maybe it would help us, um, instead of considering each pillar and seeing what are the issues and, and trying to pick a few, um, seeing what comes up from the questions from the community when we have all the workshops and see if we can uh, select uh, them in a way that, um, that we make sure that we don't just consider data from an economic point of view, but also from a social and cultural point of view, from a governance point of view, from absolutely a technical point of view. We consider uh, you know, inclusion, not just from a social perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Um, I'm just wondering if we could, we could have these horizontal tracks that would uh, guide us through the, the, the issues that we're having in the three pillars. Just an idea. I don't shy from complexity and processes. <laughs> and I have to say, I think you just, just kicked it up a, a half a notch. Um, I actually think it's a really interesting idea, and I'm wondering if we try and do that within the evaluation and program structuring process, or if we actually allot a couple of sessions um, where maybe you know, a MAG member or two and somebody from the OECD and somebody from ICC bases or other organizations as well come together and pull together two workshops on, on that horizontal policy. So do it as a kind of as a, a separate layer or an add-on above. I'm okay with either one. I think it's an interesting thought to do that. Um, and I don't think it should be an either or. You know, everything becomes horizontal or, or certainly not that everything's vertical either. So I think maybe a couple of workshops that actually looked at I think that would be really useful. It would be really useful probably, I think, to feed into the HLPDC process as well in terms of some of the things they're, they're considering. So if nothing else, it would be an interesting kind of pilot or experiment or you know, test case or something for some of the things I think they're imagining. Tamea? Sorry to jump back in the, in the queue. Um, I, I'm, I'm short air about others be, um, that want to speak. Um, we could, I think, explore that idea, and also I think this would 
be enriched in their reporting if we would pull out uh, from the various sessions that are taking place um, the, the messages, the, the summaries uh, under these, these considerations. Um, so, you know, taking safety and security and think, okay, what were the messages on economic considerations around safety and security? What were the messages around social considerations? So from the various workshops, you would report back and, and, uh, and have maybe a, a more um, broader uh, set of uh, input than, than just trying to make sure, okay, you would have 12 sessions and, and this, this consider that and then just share that. I don't know how that would actually look like. This is just an idea that popped into my mind right now. So I'm happy to work with, with everybody on, on, on flashing this out more if there's interest. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, thank you. So let's actually keep that in front of everybody and we'll just continue to move it forward. Raquel? Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Timea, for the wrap up. For those like me that are kind of back to back meetings here at Business Forum, this was super helpful. Um, and I, I, I really enjoy your idea and I wanted to support. I think beyond, uh, uh, we usually set the frames within the, the criteria of stakeholder groups and other diverse balances. And uh, that's precisely what we talked about. Let's make sure that we also have the different perspectives and uh, we should make sure that this is in the evaluation process. And um, I'm not sure if I'm disturbing too much the agenda, but one way forward is also to ensure that this is in the main sessions, either if we decide to have the first, the, the beginning and at the end, uh, we need to ensure that this is the narrative with the different policies, views, economic, uh, social, and uh, the technical dimensions uh, that are fit in. And um, so that would be my suggestion to follow up on this idea. Because if we do this one workshop, it might be competing with all the others, right? Um, and the main sessions are precisely to put this, uh, this together. Thank you, Raquel. We can sort of let this discussion sit for a moment and go through the other two narratives to see if there are any other points of clarification or additional information, then come back and um, figure out what we want to do. Maybe I could ask um, Chengatai in the background. I mean, what I'm sort of assuming at a high level here is that come Monday morning Geneva time, all the submissions are in. What would be helpful to know is when we would know, just by sheer number, how many were in those three tracks, possibly how many were in sort of, if, if one of them has a significantly high number, um, to start to look at the issues or the tags below that to see if there was an, a consolidation around some of the tags. Because as soon as we do that, we know how many different mag groups we need. Do we need three or do we need four or something? Um, and I think it gives, I think it would give people sort of a, a comfort um, presumably, quite quickly, we could, we don't even need to know at that point who are the MAG members that are assigned to each one of the themes, but if we actually had the workshops group, people could go in and start looking at the policy questions across those themes to just get a sense of what's there. And I assume you need to know whether or not we're looking at three or four groups of MAG members to review the proposals before you can actually do the, do the assignment, but it would be helpful to know um, how quickly we could get just that top level information together so the MAG members could start, the, the proposals are available, could start kind of, if they know that they're going to be assigned to the data governance track, they can start to look at the policy questions that are across the governance track and I mean, are there some other, you know, quick extracts we can do that would be helpful? I mean, maybe within any one track or sub theme we just capture all the policy questions to see if that makes kind of an easy entry into the discussion or um, so if that's too much to ask in terms of doing that in the, in the background of the meeting here, I fully yeah, I understand mean, that. Yeah, no, uh, we, we can have those answers next week, um, you know, mid next week, Wednesday, Thursday. We just have to have Monday, we're fixing problems. A, I couldn't click and stuff like that. Tuesday, we're going through to find out whether or not um, all the workshops that have been submitted actually fit the, the criteria. And then um, Wednesday we can do because it's automatic. I mean the right. so yeah we can t tell you by you know Wednesday. Uh, being a programmer, make it Thursday. But yes, you'll get it by then. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Changatai. Just so we can sort of think about what some of the background processes need to be in the background. And this is, I think, more about helping some of the MAG members understand some of the kind of tools or different entry points and timings into the process maybe would, would help. Um, so we've exhausted the queue at the moment. Um, is there somebody who wants to speak to either the data governance or the safety, security, stability, resilience? Ben, thank you. Hi, so um, I was one of the people involved in data governance. I know Helani's on the phone was, um, I think Natasha and Maria, uh, who actually started it off. I, I only got involved once we left Geneva. Um, and, I, and then I was away when it got wrapped up. But I kind of um, led the development of, of the narrative framework. Uh, I'm not sure if you'd like me to read it out like we did with Paul, um, but certainly as like a, a context um, before I do that, um, I think I talked in Geneva, you know, one of the ways of getting more business there is, is making sure we look at issues from business perspectives. And certainly it seems like there's a big consensus and, and built into the workshop evaluation now that one of the things we need to look for is a diversity of policy perspectives in the workshop proposals. Um, and that was very much front of mind um, when we uh, drafted this narrative framework that that brought in both the ideas of how um, data can uh, can cause give rise to concerns related to privacy and and how data is used and, and bias and algorithms but also that data uh, can have a great role to play in bringing economic development and enabling digital transformation um, so just to help people kind of absorb um, I can can just run through um, the, the the three paragraph description. Um, the, the track would look for discussions on the fundamental challenge of ensuring the benefits of the data revolution to contribute to inclusive economic development while protecting the rights of people. And the global nature of the internet and the transfer of digital tra information across borders brings an international dimension to discussions around data. The generation, collection, storage, transfer, and processing of data, including personally identifiable data, have enabled new social, cultural, and economic opportunities. At the same time, the massive collection, transfer, and processing of data, in particular through the application of algorithms, AI, machine learning, by public as well as private entities, pose challenges around privacy, freedom of expression, and the exercise of other human rights. So data government's track will therefore contribute to identifying best approaches to uh, ensuring the development of human-centric data governance frameworks at national, regional, and international levels. It will enable an exchange of views on how to support and operationalize the exercise of human rights and the empowerment of individuals in their digital identity in current uses and development of data-driven technologies and it will consider how to create the conditions needed to facilitate data-driven innovation, to ensure competition, and to foster trust in the development of services and new technologies, including through the use of inclusive data and the fulfillment of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So you can see there's a lot of ideas, and you could say a lot of perspectives, or you could say two perspectives. I, mean, I, I certainly think of the three themes, the data governance theme is the one which potentially lends itself most to looking at things from one side or the other to being oppositional and that's why it's important to hopefully that the workshop applications and the policy questions that are brought forward that look at different elements of data governance allow for bringing in those different perspectives and those different sides of the debate. I don't know if that's helpful as an introduction. I think that was very helpful. Thank you. And, and I do think reading through actually helps give everybody the time to <laughs> think it through and absorb it as well. Um, this is, this is, the speaking queue is empty. 
you know, this actually says that the data governance track will contribute to identifying best approaches to ensure the development of human-centered data governance frameworks at national, regional, and international levels. You know, we often talk about kind of outputs and, and recommendations, and one of the biggest benefits I saw when I was dealing with policy issues or that I saw through uh, interfacing with the technical community is the ability to actually break an issue down so that it can actually be addressed. Lots of these topics are all just conflated, and they're not pulled apart, and, and if they're just kind of aggregated highly, you sort of don't know where to start, and you don't know how to break it apart, and you don't know who to pull in or bring in to help with the, the kind of problem resolution. So, you know, one of the most important things I think we can get out of a lot of these activities, given we're multi-stakeholder, so we have the ability to look at it from all those different perspectives, Given we're global, so we have all the richness um, that that actually brings into the discussion, to be able to uh, help build frameworks for how people should think about these problems is enormously helpful. You know, we never said the IGF was the place for answers. We said it was a place to facilitate debate, discussion, understanding, knowledge, and, and that we expected policies um, to go back and be done at national and regional levels. I think we also would hope that the corporate sector would pay attention to some of those concerns and build that into their policies and products as well. But it was always to be done elsewhere, not, not there. So when we talk about recommendations, to my mind it's that breaking apart and looking for the nuances and framing the problems and here's what would be a helpful way to think about it, here's some considerations, here's who should be involved in these. It's, it's that kind of, kind of directional leadership set of activities that I think the IGF is so <coughs> well placed to do. Um, so, I mean, I think that phrase just sort of really kind of captured it for me as well. It wasn't to build a framework for the world to go away and look at every data governance issue, but um, I think the more we can pull it apart and, and um, place it on appropriate tables is very helpful. Speaking queue is still empty. Anybody who wants to come in, Daniela, too, anytime you want to come in, just jump in, nudge me here. <laughs> and and Chennai was one of the others who was closely involved. Um, I, I was just thinking you, you might want to check before opening the floor generally whether any of the other main contributors wanted to chime in so it wasn't just me. Because I, I, it just certainly I didn't do it all on my own. It's very little any of us do on our own these days. <laughs> But uh, appreciate that. Are there any other working group um, members, the ad hoc working group members that want to add? Or Chennai, sorry, you have the floor, Chennai. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for calling to the floor. So I've been listening to the first session and the process going on, and I can say as a first time MAG member, it's a bit overwhelming trying to actually assess what we're trying to do, but I see that we're trying to have a tangible output as has been marked with the initial conversations. And so I was um, wondering, um, also taking into account the not trying to put on extra work to what we already have. So I was wondering if um, in all of this, I know it was set up as a working group to determine the tracks and to actually analyze what's going to happen. If perhaps there's some form of collaboration or cross-working with the BPF on big data, AI, and governance, because I do think that that track feeds very well into what we're trying to achieve by having that track and calling the community to contribute to it. But maybe also, um, depending on what the discussion in terms of outputs and what we're trying to impact ends up being, but perhaps to also work with that group and to feed into the, their main session or however the sessions that you're going to have at the IGF to actually say, this is what came up from the sessions that were submitted. These were the people that were identified as being important to having in the room. and. Um, perhaps that taking stock that had been suggested earlier, also to say a sum of this is what the community feels about data governance that would feed into the BPF on AI. And I think that's a very good, um, very good input. And to see if there was anything in particular that could be echoed or, um, you know, in one, in one direction or the other. Thank you, Chennai. Raquel Gatto. Thank you, Lynn. I also contributed at some parts of the um, 
the narratives as much as I could at uh, the last sprint <laughs> before we delivered. Um, I just wanted more on the substantive discussions that we are having and expectations around it, right? I think uh, one of the things we heard yesterday is there is this momentum where you see a lot of the um, you see an expectations that we need to do something. And uh, for me, this, uh, this, the three tracks actually are, um, are in a very, very good place to bring this something that at least uh, an idea of the something that can be done. And um, as Ben was reading also, uh, building on uh, the experiences that exist. So this narrative is precisely on data governance, wants to identify the best approaches that are going out there. But I also think we need to put what is the problem that we are trying to solve and uh, and then build with the experts and with our existing discussions. So either the BPFs, the DCs that are involved in this, in this topic, um, data is being collected. Uh, we need to identify and sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it was confusing. But anyway, um, I, I think it's important to, to identify all the, the, I mean, the paths. So identify the problem, identify wh what is being done, and where are the gaps and where we need to move forward. And um, so keep, the, keep that in mind. We are not answering some abstract um, uh, thinking. We, we are trying really to achieve something here. So I hope that's helpful. Thank, thank you, Raquel. Daniela, did you want to come in now? Um, thanks, Lynn. Yes, maybe just one reflection that came to my mind. Um, when we have discussed the first track, I think the main policy questions are how to achieve inclusion in different aspects, because the aim, inclusion, is clear and shared by everyone. Um, and there, uh, we should come up with some kind of outcome, what kind of mechanisms um, are good to achieve inclus inclusion, right? Whereas uh, for data governance, I think the topic is much more difficult in the sense that you have a lot of trade-offs here. Uh, and maybe it could be helpful um, to address those trade-offs directly. I mean. Let's say, for example, if we talk about um, privacy and we talk about regulation on privacy, then on the other hand, we will have also to take into account what that means for innovative processes, for example. Right? And um, if we um, have that in mind when looking over all those uh, submissions, that could be helpful and could also be help to structure maybe um, the workshop sessions. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. Are there any kind of comments or reactions to what's been said so far, um, generally on data governance? Give everybody a moment. If not, we'll walk through a similar exercise for security, stability, safety, and resilience. I mix up the order every time just to keep it fresh. And then we'll come back to um, what we what we want to get out of the the three track narrative process. Still seeing no call for the floors. Can I ask for a volunteer to walk through the security, safety, stability, resilience track? I'm trying to think who is a member of that working group, ad hoc working group. Who's not here? But, I mean, it wasn't a group of one. <laughs> Who else was in that ad hoc working group? Okay, well, um, I can read it out, I guess, as well as anybody. Um, so let me pull it up, and then we'll ask um, everybody to um, kind of react or comment on it. So um, again, the narrative reads, 
security and safety are prerequisites to economic growth and a healthy digital environment beneficial to all, while security, stability, and resilience refers to the systems, infrastructure, and devices, safety and resilience of the users are also of paramount importance. Under this theme, potential risks to security and safety will be discussed from various angles with due consideration to how stability and resilience can be achieved. Strategies for protection of both systems and users will be addressed, taking into account a multidisciplinary perspective to potential solutions and the importance of stakeholder collaboration for responding to the growing range of threats to the global Internet and its users. So I thought it was interesting with this one is that it actually says it's going to be discussed from angles, um, but with consideration to how the stability and resilience can be, can be achieved. So I thought that was a... Um, an interesting way as opposed to it's not four kind of equally separate tracks. It was two of them that were actually feeding into a stability and, and um, resilience potentially as one area of outcomes. Any other reflections or comments on it? Okay, I don't see anything in the in the chat room um, either. I think we need it's time then to come back to say, having agreed on our desire for a um, cohesive, more focused IGF, um, less parallel tracks, um, three major themes, narratives that we were expecting would kind of help drive a, a set of workshops and discussions, focus through policy questions, trying to lead to some kind of concrete um, advancements um, here. I'll, I'll come in a moment, Raquel. Um, lead to some concrete advancements here. What does that mean for the review process we're about to embark on as, as MAG members? So I'll come back to that question specifically in a moment, but let me go to Raquel. Raquel? Raquel Gatto. Thank you, Lynn, and I'm sorry it took some time to <laughs> between hit the button <laughs> when you made the first question, so I don't want to disrupt uh, too much the, the, the discussions. And um, I mean, also, I think the, the just back to the security and safety uh, residence uh, track, this was one of the hardest to merge together because I think you have pretty clearly, um, I mean, as an overarching uh, team, as the trust, Right, the trust framework that we want to put forward, and then uh, you have pretty heavily two uh, two components: uh, the cybersecurity concerns and the safety concerns. And uh, and that um, on, on the second one, I also would like to to mention. Um, I see a clear um, relation with the the other tracks, right, and and all of them really. Uh, but if you think about the data governance one and while we were talking about how this path of uh, collecting data, using data, the trade-offs that are involved, uh, they are also connected to the security that we want to, uh, in those um, in those processes. So um, at some point, I also think we need to uh, work, and now going to your last question on what it does it means for our review process, is not only keeping that in mind, um, the, the the single f uh, tracks that we 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 made, but also the interdependence between them, uh, which I think is going to create an even stronger um, outcome for for the IGF. We are telling a story here. Uh, of we want people to be included. We want people to be included, and once they are there, um, we want them to be safe and and to have this whole framework of. Um, uh, security and, and stability with the, the with the internet governance ecosystem. Let's say. Thank you, Raquel. Well, let me. So let me try again with what I think our meta-level objectives are for the program this year. I want to draw a line under that and make sure we're all aligned, that that's what we're really trying to do. 
and then um, maybe work towards a high-level descriptor of what the process could be. I'm going to ask Changatai in, in the background to um, just look and remind me when both the next MAG meeting is, when the MAG, I want a few key dates. The next MAG meeting is when, um, when does our timetable call for the MAG to actually get the proposals and begin their review so we figure out what kind of interim processing time we have. If you can just pull up those dates, it would be helpful. Um, in the meantime, um, let me go to Mary, Mary Aduma. Mary, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Mary, for the records, uh, and um, NIGF. Um, I, I see linkages in the three, three tracks, and just as we established in the first one, so it will be the same as the second and the third. And um, what Tamir said about getting, um, bearing in mind what each of the uh, stakeholder groups will be expecting or what we expect them to take away and uh, what they're expecting um, IGF to, to come up with. I think that should be at, at the background while we're evaluating this. Uh, will the policy questions address the needs of each of the stakeholder groups, be it government, business, or you know, the civil society? And uh, that would also help in the second one, the data governance, and as well as the, the cyber security or the safety uh, track. And um, uh, having said that, um, uh, for, for those of us from the technical community, what is it that we are looking for? And that would also be, be at, our, uh, in our, at the background as we do the evaluation and as we, as we do the report. When, while doing the report, since we are looking to, uh, to giving the stakeholder groups some of the outcomes, so we'll be looking at those outcomes that will relate, that will be of interest to the stakeholder groups. That's my comment for now. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mary. I did think that was an interesting um, suggestion from Tamea, so I think we should figure out how we, how we weave it together. Um, Paul, Paul Rowney, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, Paul Rowney. I, I, I don't know whether this is the right time to, to say this, but I'm just capturing some stuff that's been said, and I think it's quite important that we capsulate it. And that is that, uh, that when, we do, when we run the tracks, it should be over the three days or whatever of the uh, IGF. So we shouldn't be trying to bundle them into one day per track. And that uh, we should top and tell these tracks with the, the main sessions, for want of a better word. But basically, where we're introducing the theme and uh, we're enabling people to ask the questions and give some input about uh, what they're expecting from those particular tracks and then you know end it with the stock taking, etc. But uh, that when we get the workshops, we should try and organize them to tell a story so that uh, they're not jumbled up. So that uh, anyone that uh, participates in a track, you know, they're taken through a process and it's a logical process that builds on, on the theme, basically. So when they get to the end, you know, so something like access, then infrastructure, digital skills, you know, sort of ending with policy possibly, but not necessary in that order. But just building that story as they come through, which then leads into when we close off with the bring it all together, uh, uh, what, 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 what do we call that, uh, taking stock <laughs> of that particular track? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And that was helpful and nice and concise. Susan Chalmers, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so I think that I, I appreciate that um, we are now, we're headed towards defining questions for each of the um, the themes, the policy questions. And I do think that will be helpful in terms of uh, cohering the program. I, I just do want, uh, for, the sake of, um, for the sake of process, I want to recall that during our first meeting, um, 
I, if, if I recall correctly, we decided against um, defining the policy questions um, for the workshop proposers to react to. I, I just want us all to recall uh, that we, I think that found consensus. Um, so I think it would be useful to hear from um, MEG members on the process for coming together and based upon the, the policy questions that were submitted during the process to, um, to discuss what those policy questions are based upon uh, what has been submitted bottom up from the community. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I don't think anybody's um, suggesting that we kind of move away from that consensus at the first MAG meeting. This is more about, I think Paul used the words, tell a story. So I wasn't suggesting we come up with brand new policy questions. Um, but more that we figure out how we tie together what the community tells us they're interested in through their submissions, which include a policy question, to try and frame those discussions or thread that discussion. Um, some people were using the word story, but, but that we actually, at the, at the end of the day, I think, make some concrete advancement in a small number of areas. And the only reason I say small number of areas is because if we go to a large number of areas, and I think we're just back to the same process we had last year. And I mean, I'll come back to the fact that, I mean, I, I think we have heard repeatedly for years now that people are looking for more useful outputs, more concrete, focused outputs out of the IGF. And we saw yesterday that, you know, the Secretary General, who presumably is listening to his member states and his committees and all sorts of other things, was concerned enough about um, what's being done in the world whether inside or outside of the UN system with respect to digital cooperation and the ability to address kind of the implications of frontier technologies felt strongly enough about it to convene a high-level panel. That high-level panel appears to be considering three models. Um, even the one model that had a place for the IGF in it, I would suggest if that goes forward, is not the IGF we all know today. It's probably not the mag that's structured today. There's probably something more directional on top of it. There's probably some sort of superstructure on top of it. It's not going to be just keep your kind of evolutionary <coughs> path and keep doing what you're doing, because I think we're getting a lot of clear signals that that's not enough for a lot of people. So what I'm really trying to encourage us to do is to listen to all those signals, because that's who we're here to support. We're not here to make the mag feel good, frankly. <laughs> you know, We're here to try and help advance all of these processes on the basis of what a lot of people tell us is important from all the different multi-stakeholders. So I'm just trying to figure out how we, how we pick up our game and, and do some of that. And it would be really nice if we had a significant display of what we can do in the community through bottom-up multi-stakeholder processes that actually advance concretely some of those issues before we're told there's some other process in the wings and, you know, thank you very much. This was a great experiment, but, you know, we're going to begin moving to something different. And I think that's extremely likely, guys. So I do that, too. Yeah, so that's why I'm just really trying to push this a little bit here. And I want to maintain the integrity of the process, and I absolutely want to stay within any expectations we set with the community. And at the same time, I want us to push as much as we can to address some of those other things and work with the community to make sure that's okay <coughs> and okay with them and supportive. And honestly, I think most of them want more utility and value and usefulness out of the IGF as well, so they can s walk away with things that they can say, this is where we made a difference, this is what we did, this is what I can share, this is what I can take here, because I think they'll feel a lot more pride in what they're doing and will make more of an, a, more of an impact. So, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about changing something or moving away from a, a consensus, I'm really just trying to kind of lean into all the great information and great knowledge and expertise we have broaden that significantly because we hear repeatedly that, you know, we're not inclusive enough, that there are whole parts of the world that we're not engaging. Um, and we need to find a way to begin bringing them in truthfully. I mean, again, as I said, I, I, I think taking the HLPC report to the IGF in Berlin is great, and we should do that. And at the same time, I also think it's not nearly enough 
because I don't know how that conversation feels any different than the conversation we've had in a few years because it's the same people. And we just need to look to the working group on enhanced cooperation to know how those conversations go and, and will go. So if we really want to understand how we can make a difference and how we can bring some of these other communities and we need to find a way to reach out to them ahead of time and that's going to be through different sort of online process and it's going to be feet on the ground as the NRIs have found as they've tried to reach out through their own national networks through lots of different processes and and you know I'm I'm actually excited by all that and the opportunity and and actually for the first time in a long time I feel that we've got enough attention on enough attention I, we have significantly more attention to this process and the importance of the work than we've had in a long time and I think it's still far short of what it needs to be to be able to do the work effectively but I actually feel that you know kind of the spotlight's on us we have the opportunity to really do something with this in the next six seven months which actually shows its potential um, or I think we'll be you know honestly I think probably very slowly we'll be um, moved to less and less relevance and and I think that's a huge 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 loss Susan? Yep, thank you, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I agree that um, we are moving forward and this is evolving. I think that's uh, undeniable. Um, but I just want to remind that in terms of losing relevance, that the IGF has actually drawn more people uh, to attend in the past than it ever has. Um, heads of state. Um, are now addressing. So I just, as we are, I, I just like for us to collectively just remember that we are getting more proposals than we ever have. We've been more inclusive than we ever have. So it's just, I just want us to keep that in mind and, and that I don't want that to be lost um, as we go forward. No, and, and I don't either. And I think all that's great. And I also think it's not enough and not as much as we can do. So I, I am really trying to be just as positive as well, but I mean, I think there's much, much more we can leverage out of all of this. Yeah. Um, we have Raquel Gatto in the queue, and then we'll continue going through Raquel. Thanks, thank you, uh, Lynn. Uh, well, I raised my hand for one thing, but then <laughs> I guess we have all with the discussion, and perhaps I can uh, bring some of this. Um, also, I think it's not one, uh, uh, one or another, right? I think both can be balanced. We are not, as Lynn was saying, and, and thanks so much, Lynn, for pushing us forward. I share with you the same view, uh, and it's an op optimistic view. We have this opportunity right now uh, within the MAG. This MAG can take on the responsibility and have the opportunity to bring some of the answers or, or at least the path for those answers that are uh, out in the table and to bring this relevance back to the IGF. Uh, I also hear, Susan, uh, the concern that th the IGF has grown based on this bottom-up, transparent processes, inclusive processes, uh, and this shouldn't be lost. But there is a, a balance that we can do. Uh, and one of the things, for example, back to a very concrete um, example that you, you, you said with the policy questions, uh, the way I saw it, uh, when we did the policy questions was uh, kind of uh, an inspiration of the MAG, what we, we see those issues going and where are the concerns. But then we are hearing from the community through the workshop processes, for the workshop proposals, what are their concerns. And perhaps, I mean, it's very hard to, to guess uh, since I didn't see the, the, the workshop proposals yet, but uh, uh, perhaps they fit into what we had in mind or perhaps not. And then there is an analysis uh, to, to see this check uh, of uh, is everything there, what is missing, where are the gaps, and so on. Uh, but we need to be all in agreement that we are able to do that and that we are going to take this responsibility forward. Because if we keep moving back and forth, um, and, and then we are going to lose much more. I, that's my, my impression. Thank you, Raquel. <coughs> Hana, Hana al Hashimi, you have the floor. Oh, I don't know, Benny. I assume Benny did that consciously to move to the bottom <laughs> of the queue. Okay. Now, Hana, you have the floor. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you. Good, good morning, and, and thank you, Chair. I think um, I, I, I really want to thank you for for the comments made uh, just now because I think it's it's an important reality check. Um, so, as a as a young female, first time member of this group, I often ask myself why I'm here. Um, and I think and I think I think I'm here. Um, because I represented for a long time the voice of, of countries that, that, that don't feel a part of the IGF, that don't feel that the IGF responds to their needs, and they don't, that don't necessarily participate uh, in the community. And I think it's important uh, for me to be that devil's advocate, because um, they're not devils, right? They're actually, the majority of them are developing countries that arguably, when we talk about inclusivity as a priority, they're arguably the audience that we're catering to. So I think it's, it's important um, <clears throat> to take note that when we talk about bottom-up approaches, that bottom is not necessarily um, the people that are contributing to the questions that are coming through are is not necessarily representative of all the questions out there. So I, I thank Raquel for, for the dual approach. I do think that um, the two ideas are not mutually exclusive. I think it's, it's important to continue with the spirit of the IGF that is unique uh, in, in the UN system, um, but also to, to find ways uh, to, to bring in other perspectives. And when it comes to other perspectives, I, I feel like a broken record, but the other perspectives are looking for outcomes. Um, they're, they're looking for something that, that they can use, um, that, that's uh, pedestrian friendly, that's digestible, that's something that um, helps policymakers. It was the same question for the panel, for that matter, uh, yesterday. Like, if they're making recommendations, are they things that you can actually apply, or is it sort of general UN reports saying, well, cooperation is fantastic and we should do more of it? Is it actually sort of models that you can take and, and you know, um, work towards partnerships on, or, or what is it exactly? Um, so, so, so that's just one observation, um, and, and I think I'll stop there, but, but just wanted to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. On a lighter note, as an older female in the room, I often ask myself why I'm, why I'm here as well. <laughs> um, to, to the really, really excellent, serious point um, you made, though, which I mean, again, um, a few people have quoted the terms of reference here over the last few days. The MAG is appointed by the Secretary General, and the Secretary General's mandate, of course, comes from the member states. And at the same time, the IGF and the MAG is multi-stakeholder, so that we bring in all those other perspectives and voices. And it's really important to remember that, you know, of the, the people we're able to reach to, to submit workshop proposals and policy questions, that that is not the sum total, as you said, of questions that are out there. And, you know, and I think an extra effort on our part to figure out what those other questions are or ought to be or should be or try and pull them in is an essential part of what we do. So, you know, the sum total of what we have to work with is not just what those people we can get to can submit. Um, and again, we really want to respect those people that are, you know, deeply passionate about the work and are engaged and are here and are submitting. Um, and. I know they would all be just as supportive as trying to reach out to those other voices that don't have that same access and get them in, and we need to find a way to, to do that. So I think that was just an excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Uh, Venny, you're moving around the queue here, Venny. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how you're managing to do that, but you were top, bottom, and now you're back up top, and now you're bottom. <laughs> it's not me, honestly. He's bottom up. I He's think bottom up. someone is. <laughs> I'm bottom. I'm following the bottom up process. <laughs> Don't hack the system. <laughs> so let me go to Roman Chukov then and follow the queue. That's no, up please. Uh, let's let's give the floor to Veni. <laughs> uh, Rom Roman, I think you. Veni, oh. I guess. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, thanks. I um, I actually did put my hand down and then put the mag. I forgot to put the mag member. Uh, flag, so that's why probably it started moving around. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying, Lynn, and, um, and with regards to the high-level panel on digital cooperation, we actually don't know what's going to come out of it. I mean, there are a lot of rumors about different ideas that are circulating. But uh, I, I, yesterday, I think one of us, and I'm blanking, or the other day, uh, was quoting um, what the WISIS Tunis agenda Descri how it described the uh, Internet Governance Forum. And I need to bring a little bit that enthusiasm down to the rules and procedures that we follow here, because at the end of the day, 
the IGF was um, set up by a different body, not by the UN Secretary General, and the high-level panel uh, is going to publish, uh, not publish, sorry, send a report, and I think uh, Jovan yesterday said that uh, he hopes the report will not end up in the trash can, but he doesn't know. Uh, and uh, this report is just uh, something that the Secretary General may decide to share or may decide to use and convene other uh, meetings or uh, gatherings of some kind. But at the end of the day, if there will be some change to the IGF, it cannot be done by the MAG, it cannot be done by the Secretary General, it can be done in a different setting. And we had such a setting three years ago, three years and a couple of months ago, uh, in, at the end of 2015 at the WISIS Plus 10. Uh, negotiations at the UN General Assembly. So I was uh, uh, in New York uh, during those negotiations and I, they were pretty intense and there was a lot of high-level officials actually, government representatives to uh, very high levels participating, uh, not just the usual diplomats from uh, the second committee of the General Assembly. So there is interest uh, among member states, but also obviously among other stakeholders. And uh, the IGF um, is uh, uh, the, uh, as it says in the WISIS uh, Tunis agenda, in its working and function, multi multilateral, multi-stakeholder, democratic and transparent. So it is uniting all of the uh, uh, existing structures and ideas and interest, if you will, but um, to go to um, uh, Hannah's uh, point about, you know, the, as she rightfully expressed, you know, coming from one of the countries a uh, couple of years ago back where, which need outcomes. Um, uh, actually, uh, in, within the IGF, within many of the workshops, there are certain outcomes. And while I cannot talk in general, I can give an example where the Internet Society of Bulgaria participated in the first several IGFs in 2006-07. Uh, as I was back then uh, chair of the Internet Society of Bulgaria, we did uh, a workshop with uh, the World Bank, uh, the Global Internet Policy Initiative, and a couple of other organizations like the Center for Democracy and Technology and others. Uh, on legal frameworks on internet governance. And there were pretty good outcomes suggesting, and these outcomes were later followed up by, for example, information document number seven at the ITU plenipotentiary meeting in 2010. People can Google uh, and find it and read it, uh, delivered by the government of Bulgaria. Uh, there were some outcomes for how the internet could flourish in a country which is, you know, uh, in transition, people don't have that much money, but the equipment is the same price as around the world. So did other countries use these outcomes? That's a different question. So I, my point is sometimes outcomes are there, but they will not necessarily be followed, and they will not necessarily be followed because different countries have different um, cultures and have different interests, and they may not necessarily follow through some outcome which may not be suitable for them. And that brings me to um, what Roman yesterday uh, uh, sent us, the uh, outcome of the Russian IGF. And I circulated ar around the MAG list uh, uh, the information that's on the website there. And it's very interesting because it goes ex exactly into what I'm saying. It's um, a quote from... Uh, the deputy head of the administration uh, of the Russian president, Mr. Kirienko, who says, and I quote, Russia welcomes all global companies in its market under the condition that they work within Russian law, provide equal working environment for both Russian and foreign entities, and respect the ethical and moral standards of Russia, as well as its national traditions, culture, and religious diversity. So clearly some... Uh, cultural and other differences have impact on the work of companies. Clearly some outcomes may not be used even if they come from countries in the same level of uh, development. And uh, 
going back to, to my own Bulgaria, the example that we gave uh, to the European Union, you know, with how the uh, deregulation of internet market brought fast speed, low uh, uh, price for the internet usage was not really accepted by many of the European Union countries, just because it's not possible to do it the way uh, we did it in, in Bulgaria. So I think we have to be careful um, how we accept the other, because it's not only the high level panel, there is like Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace also parallelly working. There will be the uh, working groups that uh, are happening at the UN uh, General Assembly, the open-ended working group on, on cyber security and the governmental group of experts. And by the way, some of you uh, MAC members ask me whether open-ended means it's open to other participants. No, it's about the end of it. It's, it's still governmental only uh, and member states only. So we have we have to watch what's happening, but I think we should focus on the IGF and try to make it as better as we can through the work and through the support of, uh, of uh, our host countries and uh, all the stakeholders and see, you know, watch what others are doing, but not be necessarily trying to adjust and influence and be influenced by other bodies, be that formal or informal uh, or uh, multi-stakeholder in the case of the Global uh, Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, or not. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Benny. So I agree with that, and I don't think anybody is trying to um, be directed too much by the HLPDC itself, but that's just one of the more recent signals of the signals we've been receiving for many, many years where people are saying they want more out of the IGF. That's really the message I'm trying to get to. I mean, that we some of us have used that as an example recently, but we're not intending to overfocus on that. Um, but as I said, we've all had many, many signals, and specifically, people are looking, and you know, and for more more tangible outcomes. And maybe we need to dive down a little bit more and figure out what that means. And I suspect it means very different things to, um, depending on what the topic is and who the intended audience is. So maybe we need to drill down a little bit to make that more more useful. Um, Roman, Roman Chukov, you have the floor. Thank you very much, <coughs> dear colleagues. Uh, Roman from Russia, and uh, thank you so much, Veni, Lin, and all previous speakers for bringing up really crucial and um, interesting uh, aspects. Uh, I think that we all uh, good good enough know the Tunis uh, declaration and uh, the mandates of the IGF. So if uh, I can quote that, uh, like for instance, 70.72F uh, strengthen and enhance the engagement of stakeholders and existing and or future internet government, uh, governance mechanisms. So, I mean, there is absolutely no restriction uh, with regard to Tunis declaration to the mandate of the IGF. It's uh, vice versa. It's uh, calls us to actually build upon uh, the existing uh, structures and uh, move on with uh, further mechanisms which will benefit the development of uh, the internet. So uh, I would like by saying this to bring up uh, the level of enthusiasm uh, a bit more again uh, and uh, to reflect on what Lynn said. I'm, I, I'm really uh, was thinking about this uh, that at first, we will uh, receive this uh, high-level uh, report. Yes, uh, what we have? We have this open-ended uh, working group, which will also start working uh, in the summer. So uh, I think that we must, like some of us, should go there and participate and discuss there with uh, the member states and the UN uh, venue uh, the results of this report. <coughs> what we can also do, um, how actually, since I'm from this sphere of like f f forums, summits and so on, and we usually really carefully work with moderators uh, before the events, yes, to make sure that the content will be really interesting for participants. So once we know all the workshop uh, chairs, facilitators and so on, uh, we can invite them to our virtual Mac meeting and we can discuss with them what 
are our expectations with regard to the outcomes of their sessions. What is really important for Russia is that uh, we do not have simultaneously like 101 uh, workshops with the same topic, like it was in the previous IGFs where I participated. I literally didn't know how to split myself up to participate in several sessions with the same uh, name. And uh, I, I knew that uh, our friends from uh, permanent mission also had the same problem. They wanted to reflect on uh, several aspects, but they didn't have a chance to be present in uh, the, the same sessions simultaneously. So uh, let's uh, put um, emphasis to quality, uh, or maybe we can even advise to merge several workshops. If we understand that we have selected the strongest one, we can kindly uh, encourage um, the facilitators of this workshop to connect with those workshop organizers which proposes deal and pass and uh, maybe invite them as speakers or co-chairs, co-hosts, I don't know, but uh, we can make, actually make, so our, our task is to make efficient discussion and actually to make all the voices heard, uh, all the community representatives heard. So, and uh, well, uh, coming back, uh, that we can gather uh, moderators online and discuss with them how they can structure their work and uh, which type of outcomes we would like to welcome. Uh, in this case, they will be prepared and they will provide us with the outcomes of the sessions. And we can also, this is how we can, if our German colleagues will uh, provide this mechanism, uh, like of having the output uh, document like final statement or, or, or whatever so we can all together draft it basing uh, on the final recommendations of each of the sessions or we can have a final session where moderators will provide some feedback and I don't know how but we can uh, finalize it but I'm really enthusiastic because uh, we have several platforms and several mechanisms uh, open-ended working group uh, this high-level report we can also circulate this report uh, for the same uh, like uh, workshop uh, moderators so that they can bring the issues uh, from the report in their sessions. So I, I, I really think we're in the beginning of the really interesting process and I hope that uh, in this year we will see some positive change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. A very, very comprehensive set of comments. Thank you. Mary Aduma. Mary, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I don't know where, what whether what I'm going to raise now <laughs> would, um, is the right time to raise it. Um, um, Shangatai said to us that the workshop submission has been extended to 14th. And here we are also looking at, uh, and now we are discussing about uh, some of the things we'll be looking at when evaluating the workshop. If there are changes that would happen in the criteria for evaluation, I don't think 14 to be, we should be considering of extending it more for people to be able to get the right thing. And uh, I don't know how many of us have been organizing webinar. We, we were saying about webinar uh, to, uh, for outreach to the communities and uh, to, 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 to our communities and those that will be proposing workshops. I don't know whether we have done any and uh, except the one Anya did for, for ICANN 64. But I thought that the outreach group would have been doing that so that people, though the, you know, the narratives are there and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the guidelines are there, but if we have held any women, I think it would have helped um, those that will submit workshop to get more information and understand the way they should submit the website, the workshops. But I don't know whether is at the wrong point I'm saying it or is something to be considered. Thank you. No, thank you, Mary. I mean, and just to be clear, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the wrong point to be saying it. Um, we're not talking about changing the criteria by which people evaluate the workshops. I think we're saying once we understand the workshops and what's come in and what we're looking at in terms of policy questions, what's the program structure we want to put together? And I think that's a, a second level question. Um, and again, recalling the terms of references that we advise the Secretary General on the program of the annual meeting of the IGF. Um, so I think we're, that's what we're intending to do is to build that program on the basis of advice and input we've gotten from the community through all sorts of call for issues, through open consultation days through the workshop submissions and so we're just to be clear we're not talking about changing the criteria 
And Chengatai does have the schedule, which we can pull up at an appropriate time and kind of walk through if that helps people understand next steps of the process. But I'll, I'll finish going through the queue here first, and we'll put that up at an appropriate time. So next in the queue, we have Paul Charlton. Paul, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, Paul Charlton from the Government of Canada. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of points that have come up. Uh, first of all, I, I think, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Susan and others who have pointed out the, that in, in addressing whatever criticisms that have come up of the, the IGF in recent years, we have to stay true to our, a fundamental nature of, of, of the bottom-up, multi-stakeholder uh, nature of this, of this body. Um, and, and keep that constantly in mind. I think that's, uh, I do think that's vitally important. Uh, I do think it's possible to, to, to do that and address some of the criticisms that have come up. And I, I, I think that, well, I hope that um, as we go through this process and we, we get to the meeting in November, uh, coming out of that, we'll have a good sense from the community whether we've, whether we've gotten it right or not. And that it is probably, it's probably an iterative process where we, try to adjust, adjust our di direction within our mandate uh, year by year and, and we get feedback and, and can adjust further. Um, on the specific topic of outcomes, I, I realize that this has been a, con a criticism from some quarters about uh, not having sufficient outcomes or sufficiently clear outcomes. Um, I, I think it's important to be, to be realistic in, in a sense that Although part of our mandate is that we can produce recommendations, for example, um, because we're not a hierarchical body and we're not a decision-making body or a voting body, um, uh, I think we, we have to be measured in our expectations and in the community's expectations of what we can produce. I agree, we, we certainly have leeway to be, to be clear uh, in, in terms of what comes out of the various events. And, and certainly to communicate that better, and we should aim for that on, on both cases. Um, but I don't think we should put too much pressure on ourselves or, or have unrealistic um, expectations as to what the, the outcomes are going to be. But, but as I said, we certainly work to improve them and improve how we communicate them. Uh, the last point I, I wanted to make was about the, the high-level panel. Um, and I, I guess I would echo what, what Vinny said. Um, and, and to some extent what you said, Lynn, that um, when Joven was giving his presentation, he mentioned the three possible views that they were looking at as they're, they're putting together the report. Um, one of them involves specifically the IGF, and a, as you mentioned, even that one might not necessarily be 100% positive for the, for the IGF, or the IGF as we know it. Um, so I, I guess I'm a, I would, recommend exercising some caution as to how we deal with that report. I, I know you mentioned that the talk of, was of bringing it in to the IGF. Um, maybe we've discussed that before. I don't know if we've ever come to conclusion of what exactly we would do with it. I, I think we couldn't really take any definitive decisions until we've actually seen the report. I recall Jovan saying that he didn't expect the report would be finalized until finalized and released until the end of May or beginning of June. So I I'm certainly hope we get to see it before our, our Berlin meeting. Um, but I think we would need to see it before we know exactly what we're going to do with it and, and how we're going to treat it. And, and as, as I think Veni was making the point as well, that it's, um, it's a separate process. And, and whatever it says about the IGF, the IGF still has its own mandate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, just want to, I don't expect we're going to see the report before our Berlin meeting. I think Jovan's comment was that he would expect it to be out in mid-June. He thinks the first possible time it would be public would be um, at the Eurodig meeting, in terms of what he was suggesting his time, which is, I think, the week after our our meeting. But just, just in, um, totally agree we should not be focusing our efforts or driving on that. But as I said, it is, a you know, just the most recent signal that um, some pretty significant sets of bodies, and I'm not talking about just the Secretary General but, or the UN, but member states behind that, um, are, are looking for some improvements, as we've all, as we've all heard. Um, and the other thing is recommendations don't need to be, you go do X. I mean, it's a framing, and it's 
um, in this instance, X has been found to be helpful, or one should consider, or pull the part. You know, there's a lot of things we could do. So, and I agree that a lot of that exists already, but for some reason, it's not accessible enough or findable enough or translatable enough or put in some context or something because we have heard repeatedly for years now from virtually every stakeholder community that you know we need better outputs and better outcomes and we, we really need to understand what that that is and in some cases it may just be kind of marketing and publicizing and and that sort of thing but um, so I think we're all in you know kind of robust agreement <laughs> with them um, with with that um, Titi, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn, for giving me the floor very briefly. I, I think that this year we actually have made a very, very um, important exercise just trying to identify three themes. It was a very useful exercise, but uh, um, actually I found that some of them are the quite huge as uh, the last one, uh, security, safety. Uh, resiliency and so on it's quite uh, huge so yeah, I think it's quite difficult to try to reduce more uh, to find uh, um, less themes uh, to, to to where to um, to, to put the, the attention so I th I know I can imagine that we are doing this uh, path in order to to have more tangible <coughs> outputs. But uh, at the same time, maybe I think uh, we need to, to reflect a little bit more on what we intend for tangible output. Do we intend recommendation? Do we intend something more, maybe uh, foster some um, um, action, uh, um, try to, to push for a, a common framework uh, where um, several countries can uh, apply soft law or something like that. So I think it's important to focus on uh, what uh, we, we, we want, we, we, mean for, uh, we mean for tangible art. I think it's important before uh, maybe to continue this, uh, this process. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Didi. I think that was good, good advice. Silvia Cadena. Silvia, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Silvia Cadena, Technical Community. Um, I, I would like to um, make my comments for the transcript and uh, for my, my colleagues here in the room on a, a few uh, observations. I made a, I sent a message to the MAG list yesterday around uh, how we package the outcomes that we have available. And on that uh, message, I highlighted a couple of words around ownership and responsibility. Not only on the MAC and on the Secretariat on how we do things, but also on the responsibility of the people that participate in a meeting to actually take ownership and responsibility of planning their participation. I think hand-holding and babysitting is very important, having tools to be able to organize your agenda, an app, a website, a this and a that is important. But it's also part of the preparation for a delegation of people attending an event to actually plan their participation. If you go um, uh, to the Mobile World Congress, or you go to the ITU um, Telecom, or you go to other large gatherings that have plenty of uh, simultaneous sessions, concurrent sessions on the same issues that it's supposed to be, everybody is supposed to be on everything. Uh, well, organizations, governments, private companies sent more representatives, uh, larger delegations to cover more issues. We are talking about billions of people that are connected and not connected to the internet, um, having uh, four sessions on one day just because we don't want to have too many things in, in parallel might not actually reflect the interest of that many people that we are trying to serve. So I, I don't think we can have it both ways. So there, there is an issue around, uh, yes, too many concurrent sessions, but at least we are in the same building. <laughs> When I was in, in, in the Mobile World Congress a few years ago, uh, you had to move through the city from venue to venue, depending on what you wanted to, to, to see. It was uh, 100,000 participants attending. So I don't think it's, it, this is a, a, a unique challenge for the IGF. I guess it's, it's maybe we, we, we want to grab too much, and then when you, you can do more than you can chew. So I, I think it's important also to try to figure out ways so we can help people uh, track 
what are the sessions that they are more interested in and, and help them uh, to follow. I've seen people that are in one workshop connected to the transcripts, following workshops in other rooms, trying to, you know, collecting um, Google documents, notes from different friends and collecting what is happening. If you are interested and take ownership of the content, you make it work. So I think it's also maybe important to try the outreach uh, working group and with help of the secretariat to kind of turn the dialogue a little bit around. You make it, you, you want it to be useful, you make it useful for yourself. We can't tell people what is useful for each and every individual attending the conference. I think that is, that is uh, not, uh, con not really conducive to anything and it's, it's just, we are just going to end up feeling super guilty about what we are doing. Uh, I think uh, also I, I want to uh, emphasize, I can't emphasize enough uh, what Benny and Paul just uh, mentioned about the, um, the outcomes, the mapping of outcomes and the impact of the discussions that have happened at the, at the IGF, the, the contributions that the IGF has, has um, uh, trickled down through the national and regional initiatives and in many cases in ways that are completely unexpected. Um, at the APR IGF in Vanuatu um, last year, there was an impromptu meeting at the end of the conference where the Vanuatu um, organizers called in for a kind of like an emergency meeting to figure out if they could come up with a, a national IGF to keep discussing the issues that were being discussed at the event. The committee was formed, funded, was appointed. They, now they have two full staff people, office space, go support from the government, money from the regulator, and their own. And their meeting is in three weeks. So I, I mean, and I, it is a super concrete outcome that they were going through all the motions of reviewing what is going on in Vanuatu after the arrival of the submarine cable. And how all that influx of high speed connectivity has changed their society and how that fits into their religious practices, their traditions and the rest, right? So there is a body of outcomes and impact out there that we just haven't asked or people doesn't, that don't tell the secretariat. You know, I went to the IGF in 2011, uh, attended the taking stock session that Henriette and Serhuisen moderated on human rights. And then after that, this happened on freedom of expression and, and uh, privacy in my country. We don't do that. We don't. So my questions on, on that email was about the survey that we could do to try to capture some of those outcomes, some of that impact at a, on a longer term, not necessarily only for Berlin, but trying to figure out, okay, can we do a survey? Can we survey all the people that have attended the IGF over the years and try to figure out how useful has this been? So we can have actually evidence to support the comments that I'm hearing in this room as if we haven't done anything which is not true. Uh, the other part that I would like to highlight also is that um, there are questions about multidisciplinary and how the IGF is not multidisciplinary. I, I think on a similar token, we haven't asked the question. If in the registration form there is a list of disciplines and you can say what your discipline is on that survey, for example, we can figure out how many philosophers and sociologists and industrial designers that like, like me have attended the IGF. It's not a meeting for lawyers and, and network engineers. I, I, from my professional network and my colleagues here in the room, I know that there, we have a musician. I know that we have very talented people that have done, uh, we have philosophers, we have other professions, that, but we are not asking what your profession is. So I don't think it's fair to say that we are not multidisciplinary also. So I think is is okay. We are going to criticize ourselves and and try to move and change forward. Can we get some evidence on on who, wh how it is that we are faring against those questions before we jump into the water and say that we haven't? Because it seems to me that it's a very unfair approach that the the IGF has done tremendous amount of work and influence a lot of policy and and I can. We can try and dig for those examples, but it's, it's great to criticize ourselves, but it's, I think that's the only way to keep better, right? But not to the point where we dismissed the, the impact that we have achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. So let me be really clear that I don't intend to dismiss anything we've done, and I'm not criticizing anything we've done. 
And I think we can self-reflect all day long in terms of how good we feel about everything we've done. And that's really important to do. And yes, we need to do a lot more to capture the outputs and the outcomes and things. At the same time, we need to pay attention to the very clear comments we've been getting for some years now for improvements. That's all I want us to do is, is to focus on that. Um, you know, this is not trying to be a hammer over anybody's head. It's, it's really reflecting beyond the 2,000, 3,000 people that participate in this regularly. So trying to kick our, our, our discussions and our thoughts out to address a, a, broader, a broader community. I mean, you know, I, I think I, you know, made it very clear yesterday how much good stuff we're doing and how much the community's done it on their own backs. <laughs> and it's an incredible amount of work and extremely impressive, everything we've been able to do. And the good news is I think people are looking for more and expect us to do more and we're just trying to find a way to, to do that. So um, I think um, some of the, you know, the mapping in that is important. I think at the same time as we document what we have done, I think we also need to find a way to reach out to those people that think we aren't doing enough and find out why. And I do think the secretary might actually add the discipline. Um, but I think we also need to be thoughtful. If somebody's here, they're probably not here because they're a musician. They're probably here because they're interested in the work of the internet or internet governance. So um, while I agree there are some um, you know, additional disciplines here, I don't think we've, to the, to the point the secretary general is making, if you had a lot of philosophers in the room or a lot of political scientists, our discussions would have a fairly different flavor. And I think we need to get more of that flavor in more broadly in, in some of them. Not that we don't have some participation, some participation already. Was Dennis looking? Uh, just to add what Sylvia was saying and also Shangit I mentioned earlier, uh, Secretariat will uh, will publish this travel uh, support form uh, very soon. And in that form, you will see that uh, we have a section uh, post-meeting report. So we will be using this, I think, in a way as an outcome of the uh, IGF 2019. And we are asking those, those candidates who are funded uh, what is the most important benefit they've gained at the meeting and what inputs they plan to bring to their community from the meeting. So basically, we are asking a lot of uh, questions to, to, uh, to make sure we are funding the right person, but also we are doing some follow-up after the meeting. And I think those could be a, a good compilation of inputs, in, at least in capacity building. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, so I was just pointing out that for some reason, I don't know if we've stopped scribing or if the screens are all just, we missed, um, yeah, we missed, we missed Dennis's comments <laughs> entirely on the record, it appears. There's no, so maybe we can try and put a, put a, put a note in separately or something. Um, Raquel Gato, Raquel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Lynn, and uh, sorry to pick the mic again. I, I guess I got inspired by this discussions. I really find this very useful, and I think in my three years here in the MAG, that's the first time we reached this level, and I'm very excited about it. Um, I do think as a middle-aged woman in the... <laughs> <laughs> version 4.0 is in the corner, but uh, so um, in this environment, I think uh, we need to recall we've been there before. I mean, um, it's just five years ago we had this big breakthrough with, uh, well, some issues of pervasive surveillance that brought us back to what we are doing, what we are committed to, and what can be done. In the MAG show, they could be responsive to that uh, in terms of bringing the best practices, that's when the, all, the whole intercessional work started. And I think we're at the, this moment again. It's not because of the high-level panel per se or other things. We are in another breakthrough in which we need to make a decision. And the, the, the discussions that we are hearing, I mean, yes, we have everything. We, we can drop the ball in our program and shaping the program and our processes to be bottom up, transparent, and so on. But we need to move this next layer of the mag and go for the outcomes. And yes, we need to identify and we need to walk this talk and now start to identify what these outcomes are because uh, I, I agree with Lynn and others who mentioned perhaps these outcomes are very uh, different types. And it also depends on 
who is participating. And that's okay. This will add some complexity, but I think we are up to the challenge and we can we can do it. And I'm very, uh, I mean, we have exercises that we've done. Uh, the working group on improvements mapped to all the, uh, some of those, uh, exp what is expected in terms of outcomes, outputs, and so on. Uh, I think the multi-year program at some point identified the components of the IGF, where they are coming from, and where they are delivering, and so on. So let's build on this, uh, on this work, and at least uh, get a comprehensive uh, list of outcomes and where it's possible and move from there. Um, I think nothing will be perfect at the first uh, <laughs> attempt, but at least we're doing something. And uh, it's not reacting to, it's showing that we can, it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, I'd like to close the floor um, after Hana, so we'll go through the speakers that are up there now, and then I'm going to ask Chengatai to um, put up the high-level calendar and then see if we can actually talk to kind of the next steps and come back to some of the kind of how we're going to process ourselves through the evaluation piece, see if we can close on that before the, before the lunch break. Um, so Lucien, Lucien Kastix, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, it's quite interesting as a new MAG member uh, as a discussion, and I'm quite in agreement with Raquel on what she said that, uh, a, a bit ago. Um, we, we need tangible outcome, and there is a clear need to reach out to new circle, to, to new, new disciplines. Um, what we can do is to consolidate session, like by helping session proposer in order to reinforce uh, communities and to bring, to bring them together to, el to help them understand what are the BPF and the disease. Uh, most of the session proposer I know have never heard of the best practice forums which is too bad, really. Uh, also, uh, very quick comment. I think the, the national and regional initiative network could play a key role as it concerns dissemination and increasing the IGF impact. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien. Michael, Michael Ishigo, you have the floor. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have two issues to raise. The first one is in regards to the extension of the time frame for submissions of uh, workshop sessions in regards to something which has just been announced about the travel support. Basically, if you look at the criteria on eligibility for those who will receive travel support, it states they must be from least developed countries, landlocked, meaning that those countries that are not economically viable, meaning those whose citizens cannot afford to come to attend the event on their own. However, now that they, uh, they, they, the time for proposal uh, submission has been extended by four days, and coincidentally, it has also been announced that people will receive travel support. I'm asking, is it possible that we can consider extending the, pro the submission dates to at least a week. Why am I saying a week? Because many people were not able to submit proposals because they never knew if they would receive funding. Now that there's light at the end of the tunnel, I can assure you many people now will show interest. If we gave them only three days to do that, I don't think we are going to get the light people to attend. The second one is the issue of, uh, oh, it's fine. I'll end here. It's okay. Time to go to this. I'll end here. I think this was one of the most important points I wanted to raise. Thank you. Th thank you, Michael. I'll um, ask Chengatai to respond. Um, but just to clarify one point, the, so there's not a confusion in the record, the, the current extension is just for two days, from the end of the day Friday to the end of the day Sunday. Um. <laughs> Uh, let me just start. For, for the extension, I don't think we can really extend because it re really messes up with the timetable. As far as people um, submitting proposals because now they can access funding. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to um, <laughs> speak properly. <laughs> uh, I don't think that we should do that because um, as far as funding, I mean, the link between funding and workshops is not that 
um, strong because we only have a few seats. I mean, we have about 80. So, and also for, we had announced that we were going to be doing some funding. So people knew that. They may not have known the details as such, but they knew that there was some funding that was going to be available. Also, there are also various organizations that do fund people to come to the IGF based on whether or not they have workshop proposals and stuff like that, if they make, make a strong enough case. So, and we need to do things in, on time. So pr extending it for, uh, we, uh, in a, in, for extending it at all, I don't think so. I think the extension until Sunday was, was a good compromise. Mm -hmm. And we'll come to the timetable in just a moment, which I think will underline uh, Chengatai's point with respect to the work ahead of us between now and, and June. Uh, June Paris, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure if I should actually say this, but going back to Sylvia's comments, um, some people may feel the IGF doesn't offer them anything. Um, I have heard people saying it's technical, it's for technicians only and that may put them off a bit. But, we also, but in going forward, we've started this year really good and efficiently, and we've made lots of changes to our usual curriculum. The problem is to make the themes we decided on to be more effective, to outreach to our community, and to be inclusive, <coughs> looking at data management and security and making it work. There's one question. How can we attract participants and donors? I am a user and believer in marketing techniques and use of research. I think that is very important to the IGF that we do go ahead with research and engaging with marketing techniques. The use of technology and social media, we need to be, as mentioned, to use with the social sciences and the research um, um, sciences to attract these people. So how do we get the rest of the world to know about the global IGF? I mean, this is very important to the IGF. A lot of people still are not aware of the IGF, apart from thinking it's not, nothing to do with them because it's technical. How can we attract them? I firmly believe that in order to do so, we need to sort of come together. I saw NRIs, DCs, MAG, we need to use our techniques a bit more and join together to make it more effective. Thank you, June. Well, I think that's <laughs> kind of an interesting or important reminder and um, maybe something we can even ask the working group on comms and outreach to take out with one or two. Um, I think we could do more with campaigns as well. I mean, there's this, you know, we talk about recommendations. Um, met with um, a Polish regulator the other morning and he was talking about the campaigns they were doing for uh, children and, and one of them is I click responsibly and they have a whole series of programs and tutorials and things that are reaching out to the youth and and it was kind of a nice way to say you need to be careful you need to be thoughtful but in a positive way um, and so I mean and I think we should you know it's not just about getting a marketing plan and marketing communications and dollars and communications and you know I think we can can do a lot more certainly through social media but even maybe with you know one or two campaigns that we can all just kind of use across the world, but um, anyway, Hannah, Hannah Ashimi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and, and I think things has been a pretty rich discussion, so I'd like to thank everyone for their, um, for their interventions. Um, building again on, on the specific outcomes, and, and, and thanks uh, to June for that call to, to action here. Um, I think, uh, I'd, I'd first like to thank really the Secretariat and Germany for, for making sure that there's a focus on funding from developing countries. I think I, I haven't had the chance to, to raise that as, as something that's new and, and super important, so I just want to really uh, commend you on that. Um, I'd also like to, to, so then going back to the outcomes discussion, um, I think based on what I'm hearing in the floor, there's, there's different there's not just different types of outcomes, there's also different levels of outcomes. Um, and perhaps perhaps the two can be considered. Um, so many thanks to Sylvia for the Vanuatu example. I think there's, there's a lot to be 
uh, done, and, and there's a lot of benefit in looking at national um, sort of perspectives or even individual experiences that come out of the IGF. Um, but, I, but I also think there's space uh, for us to foster more outcomes or, or facilitate more outcomes by supporting partnerships. And that goes back to the point made by our Russian colleague. Um, so I share his view that a lot of the time it feels like you're looking at the program, there's a lot of sessions that have almost the same name and that cover very similar things. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that it's bad that yes there, there absolutely can be space for larger delegations in some cases um, but on the other hand it's not necessarily the case that every stakeholder wants to have an individual event and, and doesn't want to partner it might be the case that they don't know that there's others that are interested in similar topics so I think that as a, as the mag there might be scope for us in reviewing workshops to look at similarities and at least let different stakeholders know that there are others interested in a, in a similar topic. If we do that, then we might actually be fostering partnerships, working together towards something that could be a more tangible outcome. Whereas if you're organizing something yourself with people that you're always talking to, you're creating a series of echo chambers that doesn't necessarily lend itself to something new or useful. Um, but I think that, that, that if we can start thinking in the review process of not just saying yes or no to each proposal, but actually saying, well, you know, this is similar to that. And this isn't, this isn't something unique to the IGF. I, this is my, my secret, not so secret wish for every UN event, like from the HLPF to the Science Tech Innovation Forum, wherever it is, even from a member state perspective, we plan on doing things and we're going around looking for partners. And then on the day, we find three other events on similar topics where we're like, oh, well, okay, obviously there were people interested so that's you know it's not none of this is meant as as, as something as of a criticism but it's instead it's meant to to really um to push the bar uh, as many of us have said here so thank you thank you hannah um so we have jennifer and halani in the i will take those two comments and then i really want to go back to the process and the timetable and try and close on that before lunchtime so jennifer you have the floor Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't sure if you closed the queue, but I just, you know, um, I'm very thankful for it, um, having the floor. Um, I agree with a lot of things that the colleagues have said this morning. I think we heard a lot on how to organize the selection. Um, from Tamiya, we heard the suggestion from the cross-cutting theme, like a horizontal thing, how we can organize the program better, and that could shape, you know, possible outcomes, which a lot of colleagues have been talking about. Roman has talked about it, Sylvia has talked about it, and then Hannah just now has talked about it as well. I think a lot of things that we need to remember, which um, both Susan and Paul said that, you know, we need to remember that this is a bottom-up multi-stakeholder process. We need to remember to listen to what the communities are saying to us, what our stakeholder communities are saying to us, and what the communities we're trying to bring into IGF are saying to us. So um, the small discussion around the policies questions are actually really good because these are the things that everybody who's submitting a workshop is saying, hey, we want to talk about this. This is what we would like to talk about. This is what we would like to hear. And perhaps this could give us a good guidance on, I think, later on in the afternoon when we're talking about main sessions, on how we can organize and, and use this resource that we already have, this data that we will have, and, and not to forget that we've asked the community to give us this, and we should definitely respond. Um, a little bit more about the outcomes. I think a lot of us, and including myself, have given examples on how different initiatives have done it this way. I don't think it's a prescription for the IGF at all. I think we really need to look at the very good work that we already have done, the, the outputs we've done throughout the year, last year, the intersessional works, and, and all the BPFs, DCs, and, and the NRIs, how we can actually package that into a form that is digestible to these communities we're trying to attract. I think I'm repeating myself, so I'll, I'll be a bit more brief here. Um, and, and lastly, I just wanted to touch on the point that um, June raised, um, and, and I'm really interested to know because I've never actually heard that the IGF is too technical. In fact, we're more we're trying to attract the technical community to come to the IGF to see that there is value there. So I, I want us to also react and, and listen very carefully to what the communities are saying to us. This is what will make the IGF useful for us. And we already are doing it such, um, such a good job. We need to package what we're doing right and saying and reacting this way instead of saying, okay, we're gonna change everything. Because I don't think that's what everybody's saying and it, I don't think it's what 
we're hearing in this room, we are doing a lot of things that are right. We just need to package it better in a way that people can say, oh, okay, so you have been doing this. And this is where I can see and find these things. So hopefully that would be helpful for us to think about. No, thank you, Jennifer. There were a lot of good points there. Thank you. Halani, Halani Gopaya, you had the floor, and Halani is online. Thank you, Chair, for the record. Halani Gopaya, Civil Society. Um, I, I think multidisciplinary is a term that has now featured repeatedly yesterday and today. And I think there's broad consensus from what I hear that this is a very important thing. And I think we have a like-minded group of people in the NAG, and I have no concerns when I hear the term. But every other time I have heard the multidisciplinary tag in terms of internet governance is by people who do not believe in multi-stakeholderism. So while it is absolutely true that we need to reach out to disciplines that are not represented, we also need to highlight what disciplines are represented so we can see the diversity of disciplines and therefore we need to do a good marketing job. Both those things are true. We need to keep in mind, I think, the danger of many people trying to replace, and this has been overt as well as more secretive, the term multidisciplinary versus multi-stakeholder. And this is really, really core and fundamental in a UN system that is not at its heart multidisciplinary. I have sat on a million workshops, expert panels, and events that the UN and private sector have hosted that are multidisciplinary but do not have diverse points of view. It's very easy for a large company in the IT or internet sector to bring 10 disciplines into the room and spew the same point of view. 10 philosophers can be there and have the same view, whether it's extremely liberal or extremely conservative or what have you. Multidisciplinary has to be preserved I'm not saying this group is valuing one over the other. In fact, we are probably on the side of multi-stakeholder as opposed to multidisciplinary. It can be both, but we have to keep an eye out that one might win in the long run. Thanks. Thank you, Halani. Okay, so at this, um, at this point in the next 20 minutes, I'd like to see if we can kind of close on how the MAG is actually going to approach the workshop evaluation process in, in terms of intent. I mean, again, we started this morning with a discussion that said um, the MAG had previously um, agreed that we were going to um, work towards a cohesive, focused program. I mean, that's obviously evident to the fact that we have three tracks. Um, we agreed at our last face-to-face -face meeting to work through a narrative structure um, and that was so that we could actually um, work towards building um, a, a story or a few themes that would actually concretely advance um, this smaller number of topics. It was also hoped that it would, that it would actually be picked up through all the other intercessional um, activities as well as, where appropriate, national, regional, and youth IGF initiatives because that would actually help um, all kind of parties, um, you know, leverage, if you will, leverage, if you will, to work and, and play off of each other. Um, so if, if, in fact, we want to stay with the narrative process and work towards the direction that was encompassed in the narrative process, I think we need to think about whether or not our historical um, evaluation process is, and I mean the full process, the process of constructing the program, not the individual workshop reviews, um, needs um, some additional step or some tweaking. So what would normally happen is, and the schedule is up there, um, the call is now open until uh, this Sunday night, UTC. Um, normally the Secretariat gets a week to screen out those proposals that aren't complete um, or, or don't meet a, a very kind of, I guess, low bar or something of, of criteria. And, um, and then they would um, set up the evaluation teams and that sort of thing. And, 
the MAG would start their evaluation process um, basically next Friday um, and have three weeks to do that, two weeks for the Secretary to analyze the reports, which tends to look at sort of very various diversity um, characteristics, allocation across themes and sub-themes, and, um, and the MAG uses that to um, assess whether or not there are any sort of gaps. Um, it's, it's kind of um, a really process-oriented view of how to construct the program. And I think what the MAG agreed they wanted to do at the last face-to-face -face meeting was, was really um, try and focus more on, a, again, a small number of thematic issues, kind of focused on the policy questions that are coming through the process and build towards a, a sort of um, a cohesive agenda. I mean, I wouldn't even say a, a threaded agenda. So um, we said earlier that, um, and again, we're going to have the same group of people reviewing one set of workshops so that one group of people would see the totality of the workshops that were there in the data governance track so that they're, they're comparing um, all those like workshops. It's not that half of them are data governance and half of what they're reviewing is security because that's hard to keep the... Um, that was actually intended to help us reduce some of the redundancy with which a few people have said um, has been, um, it needs to be improved. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about whether or not um, it was appropriate to take a view of all the policy questions that were coming in in each theme and trying to see whether or not there was kind of a, another aggregation or maybe a way to tie this together to, to support the narrative, to support a story that comes, that comes through. We obviously don't know that until we actually see the workshop proposals um, that, that come in. But if we assume that that's still um, a useful thing we want to do, and I guess what we, the only thing we don't know is how many potential kind of meta policy aggregations there might be. Um, I, again, I wouldn't expect that the workshops would actually be rated very highly if they don't have a policy question or really something really concrete they're trying to identify, because that was one of the, the key criteria. Um, we could, again, so I think what we have in front of us is that the middle of next week, Wednesday or Thursday, Chenga Tai said the Secretariat could have um, would have a list of how many uh, workshops we'd actually seen under each one of the big three themes. We could have a view of um, how they were grouped with respect to the tags or issues underneath. That would help us understand whether we needed sort of three or four MAG evaluation groups. Um, there was, and then maybe a, maybe a few people, a few of us should go away over lunchtime and think about some of the background process pieces a little bit more. But if it was also possible really early in the week to actually get, this is a data governance um, track, and be able to really quickly see these are all the policy questions that have come in. And if there's no policy question, that's fine. It would be blank. And if it was a bad one, that's fine. We'd still see that as well. But at least we would then be able to have a few days to think through kind of the policy profile that we're actually seeing in each one of these tracks, um, which I think would facilitate then maybe um, kind of a a better understanding of the sort of process we want to, to run. Um, and it might actually also facilitate Tamea's suggestion of, of looking horizontally as well. Um, so not look, the, the individual workshop evaluation process will come starting on the 19th. But to get a sense of the policy issues, the policy concerns, how they're aggregating up, um, is there a good horizontal thread there as well, is something we could actually all begin looking at I mean, hopefully maybe early next week. I'm not quite sure how quickly it is to just extract the policy questions and buy data governance and throw them into an Excel spreadsheet or something. I'm, I'm hoping quickly, and maybe I'll talk to <laughs> Lewis and Changatai at, at lunchtime. Um, because then what happens is the MAG has three weeks for their individual workshop evaluation. Um, and I think we need to, and, and obviously they're going to evaluate it according to the criteria that have been um, you know, published and, and agreed. And I think the question is then, where and how does that narrative um, review, that threaded storytelling review, horizontal look at policy questions happen? Are we expecting uh, the MAG members that are evaluating those groups to do that as a second pass of their own evaluation? Do they do it as a possible working group with a working group meeting towards the end of the meeting? Do we do it in the um, period where um, 
there's a secretariat synthesis and analysis of workshops. So that to my mind, there's two reviews. One's the quality of the workshops, and then the second one is what's the program structure we're building. And they obviously go hand in hand, but I don't think they need to go sequentially or, or serially. So those are just some of the things I'm trying to <coughs> kick off a little bit. Um, the intent was that the MAG, and again, this was with the, the um, kind of old process in mind, I think, where we would say, and that's still a discussion we need to have, we're going to have 80 workshops in total. Um, historically, the MAG would have said, okay, then 60 of those or so, we're going to assume the top 60 rated proposals are the ones that are in, and then we're going to look at the other 20 and fill in gaps. Um, I don't think that's always um, addressed the redundancy question well enough. So I do think there's another um, sort of series of reviews we need to make sure that make sure that we haven't just put three of the same workshops in place because they were all really well done and really highly rated, and that's at the expense of some other some other areas. That's what was that's what we try and do in the two-day MAG meeting, which is pretty painful and you know and not pretty. <laughs> um, that we put an extra two weeks in there so that, and in both those processes, so that we actually had more thoughtful time at a content level rather than kind of filling workshop slot process approach. So any, um, in the, like 15 minutes or so that we have here, any kind of thoughts on how we might want to process our way through um, that review? Or I'm perfectly happy to go away and work with an ad hoc working group um, for a little bit over lunch to see if we can refine that and think that through a little bit more and um, bring something back after lunch. Because there's obviously implications on the secretary and what the secretary can support. And uh, Mary, Mary, you have the floor. Thank you for, for giving me the floor, Chair. Um, Mary, again, for the records. Um, I agree with what the proposal you are putting forward, but um, I, I want to ask whether um, we could develop a survey at the end of each workshop and get first-hand information from participants at the, at the end of the workshop and then see whether we're getting something that is uh, very short, uh, just, just very short um, uh, a review or feedback at the end of the year. I don't know whether it's going to be online or it's going to be hard copy. Now, um, let me come back to say that the communication working group, I am not sure that we have been able to implement some of the things we agreed at the beginning of this um, MAG. And, um, and I, I still have the concern that if, um, if the type of thing Anya did in ICANN 64, is done all over whether though some of us are running with it in our in our uh, communities uh, for so that they know exactly what they are. i think the mag as a whole if he had if we had taken it in i mean if we have done some women as it would have been more i don't know whether we have the resources to do that so uh, i think it would have helped a lot for those proposing workshop that, that they are clear on what that is expected of them um having said that i know shangata you have drawn the line but think again thank you um so um uh, just a, a couple of quick points i mean I, th I think the ship has sailed on workshop webinars given the it's supposed to close in sort of well, tomorrow and now Sunday. Um, but I do think um, as an improvement for next year, I think having the materials early, even maybe doing something up on the YouTube, as well as ensuring that the MAG members all have the materials means we could actually use them. The NRIs could obviously use them, the DCs could use them in their, in their communities. So I think we could um, much earlier next year get some materials out and again, possibly even a little YouTube video that would actually talk to, here's what the IGF is about in 2020 and here's some of the facts are focusing on and here's how you do and, and whatever. I think that would be very useful. Um, I mean, I, I really have to support Shangatai here in terms of not being able to extend the, the date a little bit. If we look up there at the, the timetable, we have the meeting in June. It was not possible to do the meeting later. And if we do that much later, then we hit a heavy holiday period in some part of the world. But it also really extends, um, you know, when we get back to the 
the people that have submitted the proposals and, and building the program. Um, if we take more time for the workshop submissions, the only thing we can do is take time away from the MAG evaluation and review process, and I think that's not, um, not really the right, the right trade-off. The time they've had this time is no different than in past years, um, so it's not as though that was an abbreviated time or it really is, um, you know, the sort of expectation. We can, I think one of the other things we could learn from this year is um, with the MAG going to be appointed in November next, this year, um, be ready really right out of the box to start putting some of these things together, these time filled with the webinars, and um, it was kind of a new cycle for us, and we were all like, this is great, okay, well, <laughs> We need to get started, but I think there's some things we can move up even further um, now that we have one year's kind of running code behind us. And, and Changatai is saying it's a small rotation um, this year. Some years we've had almost 40% of the MAG members rotate out for various reasons, but evidently it's going to be a small rotation out this year. Um, and I think that was your uh, only comment. Excuse me. Did you address the issue of um, having feedback at the end of the workshop? No, I knew there was another one. Thank you. No, I actually really like the idea of a survey. I like the idea of an online survey. And last year I had actually mooted, but it was quite late, specifically um, asking people um, on this particular topic, what are the things you think the MAG um, could, um, or sorry, what are the things you think the IGF um, could, could kind of address in the next year so that we were actually again trying to get kind of more concrete in terms of results people were looking for outputs or whatever I think there's a whole series small of questions we can ask that would be really useful and that that means we could actually get you know the 200 voices that are in a workshop not just the 10 people that actually you know manage to get up to the mic so I think it'd be really plus all the the online people I think that would be really really important and it's not just did the workshop meet your needs? You know, kind of were you happy about it? Did you? I mean, I think it really needs to be on this topic. What what more can be done? What should we be considering and thinking? I think that's a, a really good idea. Arsene, you wanted the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I have a couple a couple comments, and I'll go very quickly. The first one is um, about the I'm seeing the, the the time frame on the on the screen. With regard to the MAG workshop evaluation, I see the period which is of less than 20 days, and I'm like, uh, well, this is my first year on the MAG, so I'm wondering whether 20 days or less than 20 days will be sufficient. Uh, I also know it depends on how many workshop proposals are in. I would suggest probably to uh, give more time for, for MAG members to work on this process. And again, I may be I may be wrong because this will be my first exercise. But what if we could take a few days uh, from you know the next item, like item four, and add them on the on the item three, to allow my members more time? Uh, I know here I'm typing on the secretariat, but um, if we can have more 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 time uh, for the mag uh, to evaluate workshop proposals, I think this will be helpful. I have, I've, I've just, uh, you know, I've just read about uh, the call for travel supports. I didn't know it was already out, so uh, it's only now that I just checked uh, the website and see it has been posted. I know, uh, as uh, a member of the, the the working group on on outreach and engagement, there is a lot we will need uh, in terms of support and collaboration uh, between our working group and the. Um, the secretariat, but as well as the other MAG members, if we really need uh, to see this working group uh, help in terms of uh, disseminating information. Of course, we had a very productive meeting yesterday of the working group, and um, we are working on finalizing our, our charter. And so we'll be having like a very good list of things that we will be requesting to the secretariat, but as well to the, to the whole MAG members to support you know this effort of this uh, of this working group so and what one of those is uh, if if like these announcements whenever they are put on the websites uh, if they can be sent to the working group as well for like a quick dissemination this will be will be very good and my last my last point point is with, with regard to the call for travel supports 
I just went through it like very quickly and I've seen there is uh, a lot of involvement which is good of NRIs you know into evaluating the, the workshop proposals but I, wa I was wondering what is the place of the MAG into this process because uh, I'm sure MAG members will also be in a position you know to support um, like of course we know our communities and as much as the NRIs committees can help you know into identifying the best candidates, I believe MAG members should also be included somehow into the process of uh, identifying uh, suitable candidates for the, for the supports. Thank you. I have to turn to Chengatai because I have to say I'm not actually familiar with the <laughs> proposal. Or the no, uh, thank you for your questions. Yes, uh, we hadn't fully publicized the call yet because we were just waiting for, uh, it's a soft launch and then we're waiting for comments and then we're going to do the bigger um, launch, that we, uh, the more publicized launch, just to make sure that there's no kinks because it's easier to fix them now than fix them, you know, when we have the big launch. Um, as f far as the MAG is concerned in um, evaluating, um, we the MAG is, of course, uh, free to suggest um, people, and, um, and we will consider them. But uh, we don't see it as a MAG process for selecting these candidates. Um, <clears throat> also, apart from the fact that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work already there for the MAG, for the um, workshop proposals and et cetera. And, I think as we see the, um, <clears throat> the way that it was formulated, I think we have a very good um, involvement, you know, bottom-up involvement from the National and Regional Initiative. So it is not, also the process is not um, confined to the National and Regional Initiatives. We're just using them as a conduit to highlight people that we may um, need to, to sponsor. So I hope that makes it clear. Okay. I mean, I would like to support Changatai in the, the, the sort of process he's talking about. That is a traditional secretariat function. I'm sure if they have a candidate and they're not sure and there's a MAG member that comes from that country or regional organization, they would, they would reach out as part of their own vetting, but um, that is a traditional uh, secretariat process. Um, Arsene, with respect to the comment about the extra time for the MAG, it's just short of three weeks. Um, uh, for the MAG to review, um, and I mean, I think past experience tells us if we shorten the subsequent periods, um, frankly, I think the it, it potentially harms the overall program structure more. Um, you know, I, I don't, what did everybody have last year, 60 odd proposals or so to review? I mean, there may be more this time if we're only into three working groups or so, but um, you know, hopefully it's not a, a huge task, and I have to say, given with MAG I was on at 240, <laughs> 60 feels, and, and the tools weren't nearly quite so advanced, 60 feels quite manageable over a, over a three-week period. Um, one of the things we can do, and I will go, I mean, we're just a minute ahead of lunch. I know there are other kind of meetings and commitments. Um, I would like to sit with Changadai if he doesn't have any other lunch commitments, and anybody else who's kind of interested in just sort of noodle through a little bit what the process might be. Again, if we can get some of these um, kind of different views of what's come in, so all the policy questions by track, for instance, and get that early, um, I think that would be a really useful piece of information to the MAG members. So if you're reviewing data governance and you see that there's a you know, fairly significant concentration on policy issues in this particular you know, you might want to think about um, is that something that really is worthy of kind of being called out in a, some sort of introductory comment? Do we want to think about how we thread those together more? Or, um, and I, we, we're not going to know until we actually see them in front of us, but I actually think it would provide some, some kind of additional high level kind of framing um, view that might be useful. And then, um, we need to think about what some of the possibilities are for a process which says once we actually have the individual workshops reviewed um, and we would come in, I think, and review the top ones by theme 
and maybe rather than just the top, again, let's stay with 80 workshops and 60 or something, instead of taking them across the entire portfolio of workshops, I think we need to um, determine an appropriate kind of weighted allocation by theme. So you know, if we had three times as many data governance proposals as everything else, then maybe they get a higher percentage of slots because that's a clear expression of the com community's interest. If it's all equal, then there's a fair. But we then look within the top rated ones within those individual themes. But I think maybe some of that hasn't been um, specified quite so much. And maybe we can meet with some of the secretariat and, and Changatai and try and flesh that out a little bit. Um, but I think if we think about this in terms of themes and really stay with the themes, I think the MAGS exercise in the later part of the process becomes easier. You know, we're not trading off, I think, ultimately, a data governance workshop or a security workshop. If we've already said these three themes are important and we want to make sure we've got an appropriate representation of them in the program. So now it's how does this data governance workshop fit with this other data governance workshop? Is it too redundant? Is um, so I, I actually think maybe the latter part of the process of the mag becomes a little bit easier, but I'd actually like, like you know, a half hour to sit down and think about it a little, a little um, quietly. But um, are people in agreement with, you know, kind of the high-level process that's emerging? Um, and I can go away with anybody else who has the time or the interest at lunch and just see if we can noodle it a, a bit more and continue refining it. Which means when we come back after lunch, at some point we could share that with um, with everybody. But I want to make sure that we have enough time, obviously, for discussion on main sessions, which I know everybody is very keen to have as well. Obviously, the title and probably get a quick reading from the secretariat in terms of how much there is to say here. Um, in, in fact, on the last item, which is a briefing on the state of preparations. Um, so if everybody's okay with that as a plan for the rest of the session, I think I would just remind everybody that, in fact, there is a dynamic coalition on domain name system issues, open working meeting at 1.30 to 2.30 um, here in this room. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for sticking with the, uh, with the discussion here, too. I think it was a good, good session. Thank you.